Now, this is the first show in the second series, and uh, the first series was done in 75. This was done in 79. And in between the first and second series, Connie and I got divorced. But we went on writing the series just to show we rather liked each other anyway. And I'm going to have dinner with her tonight. Now, this is a, a perfect example of a farce. It's got all the characteristics of a farce, except a couple of little moments when Basil muses about the nature of his existence here at Forty Towers, which are not farce-like. But otherwise, all of this is, is classic farce comedy. Yes. No, no, five o'clock will be fine. Goodbye. Oh, Polly, Brenda mm. can't start till Monday, so would you mind doing the rooms until then? Oh, no, I could do with the money. Oh, good. There you are. Now, here comes the wonderful Joan Sanderson, one of the nicest women I've ever met in my life. Wonderful company and exactly the opposite of the character she's playing, Mrs. Richards. Um, when we were writing this, Connie said to me one day, do you mind if we call this character Mrs. Richards? And I agreed. She wouldn't tell me why she wanted to call the character Mrs. Richards, but I think she was taking revenge on someone. Can you tell me how to get to no. Glendale Street? Mrs. Robert Lancaster is always good. We'll receive you for three nights. Glendale now, this character of Mrs. Richards was actually suggested to us by a tour guide in Monaco. We were spending a few days there on holiday after we had got divorced, just to confuse people. Uh, separate rooms, of course. And um, Connie uh, was chatting to this tour guide and, and, and asked a wonderful question, you know, what sort of characters do you have to deal with that were just unbearable? And the woman explained that it's this kind of woman, Mrs. Richards, who complains about everything, but she doesn't actually want anything changed or improved or put right. She's only complaining in order to get the price of things reduced. And that was a wonderful insight we were able to use. With a bath and a sea view. I specifically asked for a sea view in my written confirmation. So please make sure I have it. Okay. <laughs> I love the fact that uh, Andrew seems to be taking it all in before he switches to Kate. Now, this is funny because she gets the idea that Mr. Faulty is actually called Mr. Watt. K. What? K. What? C. K. What? C. K. What? Yes. <laughs> Who is C. K. What? K. Is it the manager, Mr. Watt? Oh, manager. He is. Ah, Mr. Faulty. What? So we now have a running joke, which every time she refers to him as what, he wonders what she's querying. <laughs> it's very silly. It's so simple. Entirely schoolboy humour, but it breaks me up anyway. It's all right, Mrs. Richards. He's from Barcelona. The manager's from Barcelona? No, no, no. He's from Swanage. I'd forgotten Basil was from Swanage, but Swanage is one of the funny names, like Western Supermare and Beckles and Huddersfield. Very nice stay, Mr. Fawlty. Oh, glad you enjoyed it. Polly, would you... Now, this uh, lovely guy is Johnny Shannon, and fortunately, he did bet on the horses, so he'd read the script, and on the first day, he sat down and put a few things right, because I don't know much about betting, but he explained about odds and made sure we got all the figures right. So thank you, Johnny Shannon, for your contribution to rewriting the script. Well, for flatter. But paid a tax on it before. Well, delighted you enjoyed your... And all fast seems to me uh, to do with concealment. The protagonist always does something at the start or is doing something during the course of the fast, which he has to hide from someone else. Or the sky falls in. Dragonfly. What? Yes, good luck. Jolly, jolly good luck with it. <laughs> I like that little look of Basil's there. Now, I'm very surprised here to see, um, <clears throat> as you'll be able to see in a moment, that the Major is reading The Sun, which doesn't feel quite right from the point of view of his character. And I think it may have been something provided by the props department. And during the course of the day's rehearsal, when there was rather a lot to think about, I must have missed it, and maybe everyone did. But there he is, reading The Sun. Basil doesn't bet any more, Major, do you, dear? No, I don't, dear, no. No, that particular avenue of pleasure has been closed off. <laughs> That is the favourite line of my dear assistant, Gary Scott Irvine, who's been working with me for 19 years now, ever since he was 26. He's going to die in harness. 
Well, he killed a hideous, fire-breathing old dragon, didn't he? Now, this dragon dialogue here is all to uh, imprint the name on the audience's mind so that when we get to the miming section later on, where he's trying to mime the name of the horse dragonfly to Polly, they know what's going on. Why did he kill it anyway, Voldemort? I don't know, Major. Better than marrying it. Marrying it? But he didn't have to kill it, though, did he? I mean, he could have uh, just not turned up at the church. I love the way he... There's the sun, you see. I love the way that Bella Barkley does that line. Now, this, of course, is one of the most famous scenes with dialogue that everyone seems to know better than I remember it. Um, but the rhythms aren't quite right at the start. They're not bad. They're not quite right. What? I am the manager as well. Manager, he manager. You're what? That's the first time we do that joke. It works very well. Yes, I know. You've just told me. What's the matter with you? Now, listen to me. I booked a room with a bath. When I book a room with a bath, I expect to get a bath. You've got a bath. I'm Actually, this is better than I remembered it. Maybe it's not too bad. V-A-T for a room without a bath. There is your bath. You call that a bath? It's not big enough to drown a mouse. It's disgraceful. I wish you were a mouse on a <laughs> I seem to mutter at the end. I wish you were a mouse, then I mutter. I think it should be. I'd, I'd show you. Uh, this is the view as far as I can remember, madam. Yes, yes, this is it. When I pay for a view, I expect something more. I apologise for the back cloth. It really stinks, doesn't it? <laughs> Don't look at it. Try not to notice it, okay? Sorry, I shouldn't have drawn your attention to it. Look at Basil's moustache, isn't that nice? For a house, perhaps? The hanging gardens of Babylon? Herds of wildebeest sweeping majestically. You see, the timing of Don't Be Silly there is just marvellous. You can see the sea. It's over there between the land and the sky. I need a telescope to see that. Well, may I suggest that you consider moving to a hotel closer to the sea? Or preferably in it. Right. Now, listen to me. I'm not satisfied. This is a glorious territory for Basil because he can make all those awful, rude, sotto voce comments without the slightest chance of Mrs. Richards hearing them. The view is invisible and the radio doesn't work. No, the radio works. You don't. What? <laughs> now, the reason I do this exaggerated turning is that, of course, the music doesn't actually come with the radio. This is the guy who's in charge of sound who switches it on from another point. So to let him know exactly when it should start, I have to make that exaggerated movement, which looks terrible, and I apologise. For... It's exactly the same movement, actually, that I'm making the Germans episode when I'm turning on the alarm to announce the fire drill. Again, it's absurd absurd and over-exaggerated and it's just a way of cueing the sound man. Maybe he was short-sighted. The battery runs down. <laughs> now, what sort of a reduction are you going to give me on this room? Sixty percent if you turn it on. What? My wife handles all such matters. I'm sure she will be delighted to discuss it with you. I shall speak to her after lunch. You heard that all right, didn't you? What? <laughs> Thank you so much. I've noticed that uh, a lot of deafness seems to be tactical. People hear what they want to hear and are able to avoid almost everything else. It's a tactic that I use myself at most cocktail parties. On this little horse, dragonfly, but big secret, Sybil, no, no. Look at the look on Andrew's face. No, no, it's lovely. It's just a bit buttery with my skin. I like this stuff, this nonsense here. All about the magazine she reads. My colouring, you know. More tonal. <laughs> Look, have you got have you got Cosmopolitan there? Or well, page forty two. You see Bert Reynolds? <laughs> you see he was a huge star then. There's a girl standing behind him looking at James Kahn. That sort of colour. <laughs> mm. Lovely. All right, I'll be in at eleven. Oh, Polly. Mm. I've got to check the laundry. Could you keep an eye on reception for me? Sure. Everything Connie does is believable. She's also a wonderful dramatic actress. I saw her in a production of uh, The Glass Menagerie once at Cambridge, directed by my old friend Johnny Lynn, and she absolutely broke your heart. It's the best portrayal of that particular part I've ever seen. I like the way Andrew stays there. Makes the picture more interesting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do love the old ladies. Good afternoon. First they give me a room. You see, she, they, she's got a chance to complain. She's not going to let that go. Would you like some of us? We <laughs> need an extra supply. Yes. Uh, would you like some of us? Hello. Yeah. 
There's no paper in my room. Why don't you check these things? That's what you're being paid for, isn't it? Well, we don't put it in the rooms. What? Well, we keep it in the lounge. <laughs> in the lounge? I'll get you some. This is really typical, classic farce. I don't know how good it is, but it still makes me laugh. Well, how many are you going to use? Manager! Because it's actually quite legitimate. I mean, there aren't any cheats in here, you know? Yes. Testing, testing. <laughs> That's funny. I've never met such insolence in my life. I come down here to get some laboratory paper, and she starts asking me the most insulting personal things I've ever heard in my life. I thought she wanted writing paper. I'm talking to you. I think I should have looked more puzzled there. I love that joke. You see that silly running joke. And then, are you deaf? That's a very good line. She said people use it in the lab. Yes, yes, she's then thought... She starts asking no, me no, 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 oh, please listen. No, no, please, please, about, I can explain. About, no, no, you see, she thought you wanted to write. Wanted a fight? I'll give her a fight, all right. No, 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 no. What? You see, this is all about non-communication, obviously, the whole episode. Um, and we usually do quite a lot of that between Basil and Manuel. But now we're taking it to new eras. That doesn't work either. I think that's a really good joke about the bell. Turn it on. What? Turn it now, this is very good, this moment, you see. The way she looks at it and then reacts, the timing is perfect. I can't read that. I need my glasses. <laughs> So another avenue of communication is closed off. I've lost them. <laughs> They're the only pair I've got. I can't read a thing without Excuse them. Excuse me. Now, I had them this Mrs. morning Richards, Mrs. when Richards. I was buying the vase. Mrs. Mrs. Richards! Mrs. Richards. I want to look at it. And Mrs. I had them at tea time. Mrs. Richards, your glasses are there. There? You see, I had to look at Polly at that moment, because otherwise I would have had to shout at her, no, 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 before she'd set off. It's an interesting little bit of technique, that. So that's why I looked at Polly at that moment instead of looking at her, which would have been the natural way to have done it. To you. What? Oh, oh, thank you, Polly. And Polly, not a word to the dragon, eh? Mm. <laughs> dragon, obviously, to set up again the mime. Are you blind? They were on my head all the time, didn't you see? Yes. Didn't God give you eyes? Yes, but I don't use them because it wears the batteries off. <laughs> It's funny how a line like that, which I find very, very satisfactory, is just really a repetition of a rhythm and an earlier line. And the misunderstanding here, 22, not room 22, but 22 rolls, very good. Oh, here is one of my favorite people, Brian Hall, and I'm terribly sad to tell you, no longer with us. I really loved Brian. He was um, a taxi driver, a proper London taxi driver most of the time when he wasn't acting and after the second series finished I heard that he was ill with cancer and I went down and saw him a couple of times and he was just wonderfully brave in a completely sort of non-showy way and he touched me very deeply and then uh, he died and I remember going down and meeting all the a cockney taxi driving fraternity at the funeral. Very sad, because such a smashing guy. And as I say, just dealt with the fact he was dying in a way. Well, if I can go that well, I should be very proud. Happy. Oh, happy, yes, I remember that. No, not that I noticed, yeah, no. I'll report it if it happens, though. I like that line. I'll report it. All that dancing about, singing and rubbing your hands. No, just my way of getting through the day, dear. The uh, Samaritans were engaged. <laughs> That's a good line. I thought maybe you were in love. <laughs> Only with you, light of my life. <laughs> or had a bit of luck or something. <laughs> Mr. Hawkins still in the tonic? We don't know how much she's on to, do we? I think she's just suspicious. She knows something's going on, but... She's not quite as inquiring as she often is. She's kind of letting it go a bit. You always say, Mr. Fawlty, but I learn. What? I learn, I learn. No, 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 no. I no. get better. No, 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 you don't understand. I do. No, you don't. I, I do understand that. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> you know nothing about the horse. I know nothing about the horse. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Which horse? <laughs> Which horse I know nothing? My horse, Nitwit. Your horse, Nitwit. No, no, no. He does this so, so well because he's so enthusiastic and trying so hard to understand. I know why you say I know. You see, if he was the slightest bit irritable, 
or fed up with these conversations, it would spoil the comedy completely. And that's why he stays so wonderfully optimistic and helpful, really trying to do his best all the time. That's what makes it funny. I spend the rest of my life having this conversation. Please, please try to understand before one of us dies. <laughs> suddenly reminded me in that moment of me trying to get information out of um, Michael Palin when he was stuttering in Fish Court One at the same kind of fury and attempt to keep a lid on it to try and get some sort of result. And of course, eventually, one of people's favorite lines. Now, now, well, pretend you forget. Pretend? Well, don't say anything to anyone about the horse. <laughs> I know that. You tell me that this morning. I love that. He's got absolutely nowhere in about three minutes. It's Mrs. Richards. The fatal accident? <laughs> She's had some money stolen. Oh, Mr. Forty. She's one of those people, of course, who, if anything goes missing, assumes that it's been stolen. Basil, you've got to help me handle this. She's in a frightful state. I can't get a word in edgeway. She's had 85 pounds taken from her room. I've said we'll search every but She insists that we send for the police. What do you do with someone like that? It just keeps on. Mrs. Richards, how very nice. Now, this is a favourite secret, again, but it's interesting what the audience laughs at and what they don't laugh at. Oh. And Mrs. Richards, I've explained to my... I've just been up to my room. 85 pounds has been taken from my bag, which I had hidden under the mattress. Oh, yes? It's a disgrace. I haven't been here a day. What sort of staff do you employ here? Mrs. It's nice that she's so unpleasant and so rude because it sort of justifies what happens next. What have you got to say for yourself? <laughs> I don't think Sybil sees yet what he's up to. <laughs> now, we had to make sure that the audience knew what was happening, so we give her this line. Wait, 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 wait. I haven't got it turned up enough. Basil. I said I should go! And the audience loves that, but there's a funny bit coming up they don't laugh at. Has it come away? Oh. <laughs> Did you bang your head? Yes, yes. Oh, dear, let me have a look. You better go and lie down before something else happens. <laughs> Strikes me that that line's funny. We've searched the room. My money's been yes. taken. Now, this line gets a belter, doesn't it? Is this a piece of your brain? <laughs> I think it's nice that he's kicked. <laughs> And the fact that he now sits down and rubs his leg he leads us nicely into a mood change. And we suddenly realize why he doesn't try too often to express his affection because um, Sybil doesn't give it a terribly warm reception. If you give us any more trouble, I shall visit you in the small hours and put a bat up your nightdress. <laughs> oh, that was fun, wasn't it, dear? The odd moment like that. It's almost worth staying alive for, isn't it? It's nice to share a moment like that, isn't it, dear? It's what marriage is all about. I know, I read it on the back of a matchbox. <laughs> Seriously, time. Sybil, do you remember when we were first... He actually touches her here, almost affectionately. Oh, quite a lot. Yes, but not at the same time, that's all. Oh, that's true, that was a warning. <laughs> Should have spotted that, shouldn't I? Zoom! What was that? That was your life, mate. Oh, that was quick. Do I get another? Sorry, mate, that's your lot. That's it. Back to the world of dreams. Yes, dear? Yes, sir. Surprisingly sad, actually, if one wasn't Very grinning. Do you think oh, she's should... left it in her room or dropped it or eaten it or something. We'll get Manuel to go through the room. Uh, Polly can check the lounge. Wait a moment. I saw Polly with some money just now. Well, there you are. It was quite a bit, too. She was counting it in here. <laughs> now, when I came back in, it would have been funnier if I'd held a little more still. I was moving. Real stillness at that moment would have been funnier. I'm asking someone if money is there, so that would be so embarrassing. Rubbish, Basil. Hello, Forty Towers. Polly Sherman, yes, certainly, I'll get her straight away. Hang on. I like the fact he's aborted that phone call from outside the hotel as an excuse to find Polly. Polly, she saw you with the money. What? So she saw you counting the horse money. She's just coming. Now, this is outrageous, this, uh, this stuff coming up. This is pure Whitehall fuss, and it is a bit too over the top, but I think we just about get away with it. you about that money I saw you with earlier on in the office. I wondered if someone had handed it in. Mrs. Richards has lost some. The money? In the office? Y you were counting it, weren't you? Did someone hand it in? Oh, no. No, it's mine. Yours? Nice little twist, yeah? I won it. You won it? On the horse, Mr. Faulty got a tip on. I hope you don't mind. I... No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I didn't know you bet on the horses, Polly. Oh, I don't. 
Only I was in the town and I'd passed the betting shop and I thought, well, why not? Well, why not indeed, eh? Jolly good question, eh, dear? Well, pity you didn't let me put something on, really. Realise how much we would have won? Sticking the knife in and just turning it a little bit. Those were the odds, were they, Basil? Yes, that's right, dear. 14 to 1. I listened you to see, one. Basil is capable of thinking very, very quickly. It's just that he gets so stressed, and as Daniel Goleman says in that wonderful, wonderful book, Emotional Intelligence, stress makes you stupid. He gets so stressed that that's when he starts making mistakes. Bird brain. No, 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 that came in third. Uh, fish wife. What? I don't think that's such a good line, fish wife. <laughs> That's, I like that. That's really out of left field. No, no, it, it got off to a flying star. And its name was Dragonfly. <laughs> it's very nice. The shot of Basil disappearing to the distance is very good. If I find out the money on that horse was yours, you know what I'll do, Basil. It's one of the famous lines. I'm going to have to sew him back on first. <laughs> Six o'clock, old boy. Uh, can I offer you a... Oh, very decent of you. Just a I wonder whether this dialogue would have been better if I started by explaining that Sybil sometimes goes through my clothes at night. <laughs> One of those. Know what I mean? Ah, cheers. Uh, Major, um, could you do me a favour? Well, I know. I'm, I'm a bit shocked myself, old boy. No, no, no. Could you look after some money for me? I want it on that horse, and the uh, symbol's a bit suspicious, you see. She goes through my pockets some nights. Oh, absolutely. Oh, no, it's all right. It's all right. When's it running? No, no. It ran today. I won that on it. Oh, well done, old boy. No, 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 no. Could you... Because he never gets anything, does he? He never gets it. But he's so beautifully mannered, and his manner is so good, that he never comes over as being completely stupid, just just sort of confused. In the morning and thank you. Understood, old boy. Cheers. <laughs> nice little bit of business. I taught myself to juggle a few years ago, and those little skills sometimes just help at a crucial moment when you need what the professionals call a button, a little laugh or burst of energy at the end of a scene. Have you called the police yet? Uh, excuse me, I'm trying to take a telephone call. Have you called them yet? Uh, yes, yes, we have. When are we going to be here? Then? As soon as possible. They're very busy today. Busy? Oh. There was a lot of bloodshed at the Nell Gwynn Tea Rooms last night. <laughs> there was a Nell Gwynn Tea Rooms in Western Supermare that always made me laugh. Now, this guy um, on the right here, um, it's a slightly odd bit of dialogue, and uh, I couldn't figure out when I uh, watched it yesterday what it was all about. And I think the key is that he's a Scot. I think it's just another joke about Scottish meanness. I remember my father told me those jokes. They were very current in his youth in the 20s and 30s. And jokes like... Uh, Two taxis collided in Aberdeen. 32 people were injured. And Dad saw a farce in the West End when a Scotsman came on and opened his purse and a moth flew out. Give it to me. Don't be a fool, Stephanie. 92, 750, I said, and I'm not taking a penny less. You tell him that. Why don't people listen? These sums don't sound very huge anymore, do they? Well, let's scrub that 32p then, shall we? Let's enjoy ourselves. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, Major, Major! Um, can I have it now? What a word. Now, Ballard Bartley does this bit absolutely superbly. Well, you remember, I gave you some money, um, just before you went to that remembrance service. Remembrance service? Yes. I don't remember that, old boy. Well, but it was, it was for a chap you, you didn't like. Um, I think it would be better if he'd said remembrance service. I don't remember that, instead of having me say one line between those two lines. No, 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 you were in your best suit. Was I? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. I went to the theatre, of course. No, no, yes, no, There's no, a joke here I adore. Yes, me is Atwell. Well, Marjorie Atwell and Marjorie, I always call her Winnie because, well, because she looks like Winnie. She's not black. Black? Churchill wasn't black. I love that. Because, <laughs> of course, Winnie. To, uh, to the major would be church. Oh, the police. I, uh, You've done no such thing. Your wife's just told me you're still searching the room. Well, I thought she'd call them. You lying hound. Mrs. Richards. Go and call them now immediately. Yes, but Mrs. Not. Richards, we will. The moment we've searched. Right. Them. I shall call them myself then. Well, couldn't we just wait until. I've never seen such a place. All right, Mrs. Richards. Would you like to use. It's a strange mime, this, isn't it? <laughs> 
Why doesn't he let the arrow go? Get the key and check our room. Right. I found it, Fawlty! What? It was in my fucking... It's it's in my oh. oh, this is where he's so wonderful. It's right down! Yes, can I, I have don't it? know how he got there. No, no, can I... See, because I make what? a point. Yes, I make a point please. of keeping my money in my hip pocket. Yes, please, please! What a boy. Can I have it? Oh, yes, 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 the money. Yes, yes, yes. Now he looks in his hip pocket. Isn't that wonderful? No, 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 in there, in there. Basil? Oh, there it is. What's that? I found it, Mrs. Fawlty. The money. Oh, the money. Oh, that's marvellous. Oh, what a Richards. What? We found your money. Oh. The Major's found your money. Oh. What? Oh, thank you so much, Major. There you are. I said it would turn up. Oh. <laughs> what is it, Basil? Better luck, eh, Fawlty? It's ten pounds short. Oh, dear. It's not ten pounds short? Oh, my God! Don't worry, we'll have a whip round. Does everybody realise that's the charity box? Should we have established? Now, this is odd. She throws the coffee at me, and what I didn't realise at the time is it's gone all over the major, too. Now, you see, Ballard Bartley plays this absolutely beautifully. He doesn't even notice. Uh, would you mind if I popped up and had a look? He's got coffee all over him. He's quite unaware of it. Uh, it's uh, in with the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Did you say it was in your pocket? Yes, can yes, I, Mrs. Richards, yes. can I... Yes. What was it doing in your can, pocket? Can I explain? Uh, you're not explaining anything. You're completely... Now we go into complete fast where everything that's been set up before comes to fruition. I gave him the money to look after. What? You see, there's been a mistake. Um, that money there is in fact mine. Yours? Yes, as the Major will confirm. You see, I was saving it up for a present for my wife, right? And I, that's why I couldn't say anything just now. But I gave it to the Major last night. What rubbish? Well, this is my money. No, no, the Major will verify what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> Again, so keen to help, you see. If he wasn't keen to help, it wouldn't be funny. Yes, you, you, you remember? Hmm? <laughs> what money I won on the horse? A horse? Yes, what are you whispering? What do you say? <laughs> He says he won it on a horse. Won it on a horse? It doesn't matter. Do you remember me giving it to you? Oh, think. Please think. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> That's wonderful the way he times that. <laughs> now, of course, we know what's going to happen. It's absolutely inevitable. Oh. Yeah, but I still think it's funny. Tell her I had the money yesterday. Uh, um, I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. We know that he's been practicing that line, don't we? He's been in the kitchen practicing it. I think I know nothing. No, no, you can tell her. You can no, tell her. I cannot. Yes, sir. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Oh, tell her. Please. Please. Tell her. 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 I am from Barcelona. I am not listening to any more of this rubbish. I'm going to finish my breakfast. And when I come back, I want the rest of my money. Give it to her, Basil. I can't find it. Give her ten from the till. <laughs> right! It's one of these little moments when he goes over the top. <laughs> I like this shirt, Joe. <laughs> I'm going to get her the shirt off my back, too. You see, I know nothing. <laughs> I'm going to send you to a vivid sectionist. <laughs> <laughs> now. Now, here's George Lee coming in in a moment, because obviously if he's behaving like this, somebody's got to see it who doesn't know why. George, in case you recognise him, was the guy who delivered the garden gnome in the uh, Builders uh, episode. He does a lovely Devon accent. You got a Mrs. Richard staying here? <sighs> Promise you there's a pad down there. Yes. Oh. Ah, well, only she bought this yesterday, asked us to deliver it. <laughs> the thing is, she left some money behind. Keeps it in this. 95 quid. Look. The cleaner found it this morning. Almost threw it in the bin. Lucky, eh? She around? <laughs> no, I'll give it to her. Oh, thanks, Mr. Foley. Goodbye. At last a moment when Basil seems to have triumphed. And in comedy, and indeed in drama, if the very ending is a downer, then you have to have an upper shortly before it, and vice versa. She, it doesn't matter. I'm ten pounds up on the deal. Ten pounds up? It's, just, it's 95. Even if I give her ten, I'm still ten up. Probably for the first time in my life, I'm out. I'm winning. 
You see, Basil is 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 honest. He gives her a chance to reconsider here. Your beautiful vase that you bought yesterday has just arrived. Now, remind me, the money that you have there, is it yours or mine? I told you, it's mine. You're absolutely sure? Yes, I am. Uh, but you're still ten pounds short? Yes. Uh, Polly, uh, give Mrs. Richards this, would you? What's that? This is mine. <laughs> Basil. <laughs> I think if we were able to do that again, we would have had Sybil come in just a beat earlier. On the horse. Uh, that's right, yeah. Polly asked me to put it in the safe for her. <laughs> I like this moment. Is he going to get away with it? Sorry, Seems he has. This is your uh, money, Polly. Uh, this is your beautiful vase. That's a bit of odd shooting here. Notice that when the vase drops, we don't actually see it. On that horse. <laughs> see? I dropped it there. I wonder if we should have seen it. Does it matter? You see, if this was a movie, we'd have shot it all the different ways, and then we could edit it both ways, seeing it and not seeing it, like we do there, and then we could show it to an audience, and they would tell us which was right. Because the wonderful thing about comedy is the audience is always right. If you're in the theatre and they don't laugh Monday night, you can say, well, it wasn't a very good audience tonight. They don't laugh Tuesday. You say, well, yes, yes, well, you know, they'll laugh Wednesday. And when they don't laugh Wednesday, well, it isn't funny. And now if you watch the credits, you'll notice that John Howard Davies, who did the first six shows, um, is no longer doing it because he was made head of the department. And he brought in a lovely man called Dougie Argent to produce it and Bobby Spears to direct it. And Bobby did all of the last second series. The uh, rest of the team had the idea that these um, letters should be assembled into anagrams and we um, all worked them out together. I think I thought of about two and the production staff came up with the rest. I was once presented at some occasion with an award by Melvin Bragg and he described 40 Towers as lovely little farces, which is exactly what they are. And of course the um, most common element in a farce is sex. And the lovely thing about this episode is that uh, there are three absolutely stunning women. So even if you don't think it's funny, it's worth watching just for them. Well, it's engaged. <laughs> I used to use the speaking clock a lot, and it was quite extraordinary how difficult it was to get through to it. In fact, a lot of this episode really is based on my personal experience because a lot of the stuff to do with sex and sexual attitudes was very much Western Supermare stuff. And um, there's a lot of other more personal stuff in here. There's a conversation that uh, Sybil has about her mother, which is actually her talking about my mother. I don't know why she stays with him. Oh, that's pretty. Now, this is the lovely Nikki Henson, who's just about my oldest actor friend. When I did The Frost Report in 1966 with Ronnie Bark and Ronnie Corbett and David, of course. The very first day's filming I ever did in March 1966 was with Nicky. We shared a dressing room together and we've been friends ever since and I'm having dinner with him tomorrow. I asked him if he could do this part because I'm so rude to him all the way through that I really wanted to invite an actor to do it who really knew that I loved him because otherwise I thought the effect of uh, one week of being insulted at every 30 seconds would kind of grind somebody's ego down and since Nicky knew and knows that I love him um, I was absolutely delighted that he'd take the part also coincidentally it was perfect for it. It's awfully good isn't it? Mwah! <laughs> Did you hear it Basil? What dear? The joke. Oh, a joke. Now I heard you laugh. I thought perhaps he was having a tea party. <laughs> All those tedious old ape jokes now come out, which I think are exactly in character, even if they're not particularly great jokes. Only from some angles. <laughs> well, from my angle, he's very attractive. Attractive? You know, easy and... You see, when you grew up in Western Supermare and went to Clifton College, you kind of thought that Gladstone and Harold Macmillan were the height of male attractiveness. The idea of dangling charms and even wearing rings was kind of a sign of narcissism and 
certainly of narcissism, but almost certainly of tendency to homosexuality, if not actual practice of the act. Happens to be a rhino's tooth. One's an ancient Egyptian fertility symbol. Well, that must Mind you, they are bloody silly anyway. It's not supposed to be handy, Basil. It goes back to the dawn of civilization. Well, by the look of this forehead, so does he. <laughs> I think that's quite a good line. Doesn't get quite the laugh I'd expect, but I think Prue and I might have played this 5% faster. You seem to think that we girls should be aroused by people like Gladstone and Earl... You see, this is really what I was brought up to believe. They have a certain dignity. It's hard to imagine Earl Hague wandering around with his shirt open at the waist, covered with identity bracelets, isn't it? <laughs> well, he didn't mind the medals, did he? The military decorations? That's not the point. Earl Haig was an old Cliftonian, incidentally. That was the school that I went to, or rather, the sports academy that I went to. I suppose I never thought of that. Good evening. Good evening. Now, here's the first of the gorgeous women, Elspeth Gray, married, you won't believe this, since 1949 to the lovely Brian Ricks. I used to love those Whitehall farces that Brian played in and, of course, produced. He was very, very, very central to that whole stream of wonderful farces. And, um... Elspeth and he is still with us and he now of course has devoted his life for many years to mencap and uh, has become a lord so we are observing a baroness there on the right now all this stuff about Basil being uh, so impressed with doctors this is pure Western Supermare doctors in Western Supermare were treated with awe as though they were sort of minor members of royalty yes well how did you become two doctors <laughs> it's most unusual I mean did you take the exam twice or <laughs> No, my wife's a doctor. I'm a doctor. You're a doctor too. So you're three doctors. No, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just one doctor. My wife is another doctor. Manuel. Now, this marvellous man is playing the psychiatrist. The husband is Basil Henson, not a relation of dear Nicky Henson. And I have to tell you, Basil did wonderfully well because he put his back out about a day before we actually got in the studio. And he did the whole show in considerable pain and it never shows for an instant. You know, people often think that actors are rather soft. Well, people like Basil are very tough and very brave. For you, but everywhere's full at the moment. Oh, well, no hassle. She won't mind sharing with me. Lucky mum. <laughs> it's funny how both Sybil and Basil rather like flirting although <clears throat> basil of course is terrible at it but the moment that they're caught by the other one their partner they become embarrassed what is that um well, it's um greek astrological sign oh it's beautiful where did you get it um colchester i think it's funny colchester is a good good name there I was with Michael Winner last week and he told me that one of his girlfriends had had a father who was the Italian consul in Stevenage. I thought that was... I laughed for five minutes. The rest of the restaurant around me were laughing because I was laughing so much. And in the morning he said to me, I made a mistake. He wasn't the consul in Stevenage. He was the consul in Bedford. And I said, well, thank you. You made the mistake because Bedford isn't funny. Stevenage is absolutely hilarious. And on that case, I thought Colchester's a good one. Life force, but mother, well... She's got more of the death force. This, this is definitely my mother she's talking no, no, it's about. All right, I'll hold. She has these well. I did a one-man show in New Zealand about two and a half years ago, and a lot of it was about my mother, and I realised now that without realising it, I'd actually recapitulated a lot of this dialogue, particularly the list of phobias, which I once counted and got to 47. Spaces. It's very difficult getting this. In fact, the interesting list to make was the things that my mother was not phobic about. Uh, for example, she was not frightened of chairs, and I don't think that bread particularly alarmed her. I don't know what she thinks they're going to do to her. Vomit on her, Basil says. <laughs> can I leave my number? He can call me back. And death. Oh, I see, right. She's frightened of death. I told her there's nothing she can do about it. My mother was frightened of death, talked about it the whole time. Nature can only take its course. The only I don't know what you say to someone. That it won't be long drawn out and painful, but she can't accept that. Oh, excuse me. Hello, John. How are you? No, oh, fine. I'm just out for the weekend. <laughs> so Basil catches her, perhaps being a little friendlier than she's supposed to be. The Abbots, charming couple. Yes, all three of them. <laughs> um, all right for the night. <laughs> you know, do that, Tim. Um... That Just a little plot line there. Wearing. You should get yourself something like that. Well, for the gardening, you mean? No, no, I can't tomorrow night. How about lunch? Yes, yeah, attractive woman. How, how Just old? trying to wind Sybil up here a little bit. Oh, now, Sybil. I really don't know, Basil. Perhaps she's 12. No, <laughs> favourite, magic. 
Yeah, it's nice to have that kind of person staying, isn't it? Professional class, educated, civilised. Got both ends of the evolutionary scale. Now, this is very well shot. Just, just look at this. This is very, very well done. And lovely bit of camera work. We're just going out for a stroll. What time do you serve dinner? Uh, 7.30 till 9. See you tomorrow then. Ciao. Do you have a, a guide to Torquay? Basil, of course, is intensely proud of Torquay and uh, always talking about the, the um, British Riviera. One of the world's shortest books. Um. <laughs> what? <laughs> One of the world's shortest books. Like the uh, wit of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> All great English lovers. Oh, it's very funny. Isn't it? Well chosen to make him furious. Are you uh, taking dinner here tonight? Sorry? Are you dining here tonight, here in this unfashionable dump? Well, I wasn't planning to. No, not really your scene, is it? Well, I thought I'd try somewhere in town. Anywhere you recommend. Well, what sort of food are you thinking of? Fruit? <laughs> uh, anywhere they do French food. Yes, France, I believe. They seem to like it, eh? The swim would certainly... I... <laughs> That's a funny line. The first line isn't so funny, but got a big laugh. But um, I still, after 40 odd years in this business, I still don't know what the audience is really going to laugh at. I can usually guess whether there's going to be some reaction, but I never know if it's going to be big or small. The golden dog, something. Do enjoy yourself. We'll see you later. I have had it up to here with you. Aren't you? You never get it right, do you? You're either she does this beautifully, doesn't she? Boots ...or spitting poison at them like some benzodrine puff adder. <laughs> Just trying to enjoy myself. <laughs> it's a nice little line. Now, this is a classic scene, I think. I'm very, very pleased with this. Beautifully played, and actually the movement in it is very good, as I'll attempt to show you. Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, would you uh, care for a little something with us? A um, little aperitif, cognac, brandy, on us? See, minor royalty, that's what they are, both doctors. Well, so thank you. Yes, I'd, I'd like a cognac, if I may. Dr. Edward? Oh, poor, thank you. Mon plaisir. Yeah. <laughs> And for you, Doctor. Thank you. Have you been to Torquay before? Well, not for a few years. No, we we had a, a free weekend and we suddenly thought we'd like to get out of London. Lovely. White or black? Black, thank you. And black for you, Doctor? Thank you. Cognac for you, Doctor. It's rather fascinating you're both being doctors. Port for you, Doctor. Because at one stage I was contemplating becoming a surgeon. A tree surgeon. <laughs> thank you, sir. They're always trying to build themselves up and the other one always pulls them back down again. Now, I like the reaction that's coming up in a moment when uh, Basil Henson tells me that he's a psychiatrist. I think this is a good choice. Are you both in general practice? No, I'm a paediatrician. Feet? Children. <laughs> Well, children have feet, don't they? That's how they move around, my dear. You must take a look next time. It's most interesting. And, uh, and you, Doctor, are you... Um... I'm a psychiatrist. Very nice, too. Well, cheers. So I love the pure ordinariness of what he's done because you don't immediately realise what a fool he's made of himself. Then you do. We had a faith healer the first month... Now, that's a funny line. I think in the you know, Western Supermare, a psychiatrist were regarded pretty much like faith healers or astronauts. They were creatures from other planets. I remember my mother said to me when I started therapy, well, she said, I mean, what do you want to go to therapy for? She said, you know, I mean, that's for people who are mad. My mother, of course, was completely mad. What's the matter with him? Psychiatrist. And they're also very defensive about psychiatrists because they have some sort of idea that the psychiatrists can see into them and, and, and kind of know their secrets, which makes them deeply, deeply, deeply suspicious and uncomfortable. Robin Skinner told me once he used to find this at parties. He'd be talking to people and he realised that they kind of thought that he was trying to look into their soul when in fact all he was trying to do was get a just drink. Distance. I mean, remember who you are, all right? Remember who I am? Well, just don't tell him too much about yourself, all right? That's what I'm perfect. All right, okay. all right. What have you told him? This is Western Supermare. Yeah. Scotland. Scotland? What do you want to know about Scotland? Oh, <laughs> Why are you so nervous? I'm not nervous. I'm just saying take it easy, all right? All of us. Just take it easy, right? This is a nice bit of dialogue. I'm just saying take it easy. I'm trying to say take it easy without starting a panic. I mean, what is going on? <laughs> Mr. Faulkner, take it easy. Now, no, look. Well, get, get one thing clear, all right? You don't tell me to take it easy. Well, right? I don't pay you to tell me to take it easy. I pay you to take it easy. No, I pay you to tell you to take it easy. So take it easy, all right? <laughs> Why are you getting so upset? 
upset. I'm not. You like And people who get upset like this always will deny that they're getting upset. I'm not, I'm not bothered by that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not bothered by that. If he wants to be a psychiatrist, that's his own funeral. They're all the matters bloody march hasn't he? But that's not the point. The and that, of course, is true. He gets, he gets paid for sticking his nose. I'm joking, of course. And in fact, uh, Connie is now practicing as a therapist. She uh, went through uh, absolutely formal training, took a long time doing it, and now regularly sees patients. And um, she kind of just lost her interest in show business, and uh, particularly in acting, which she used to love, and suddenly it didn't mean anything to her anymore. So she's moved on. And uh, she doesn't want to do publicity anymore, even for 40 Towers, because she feels that it's confusing for her patients if she suddenly started appearing on television. Just sign that. Thank you so much. Now, this, watch the movement here. This is really good, what he hears and what he doesn't hear. They can arrange their holidays. How often you can get away? Hmm? How often do you manage it? You see, that's really well set up. <laughs> he hears exactly the right amount, and he doesn't hear the key things, just by going to the doors and handing the plates out. Then you have a perfect misunderstanding. In the audience, of course, knows exactly what he's thinking. Average. Mm -hmm. What would be average? Well, you tell me. <laughs> well, a um, couple of times a year. What? Once a year? Well, we knew it must be difficult. My wife didn't see how you could manage it at all. <laughs> wonderfully delivered that line by Basil there. and as I say the guy is in extreme pain now and he's just controlling it turning in a great performance We're quite normal down here in Tokyo, you know <laughs> and he says now this is a little moment that happens I think in most episodes I have to admit when Basil has made some awful assumption and got very defensive or angry about something and then he comes out and either Polly or Sybil explains to him that he's totally misunderstood something and made a complete prat of himself. I can't leave anything nicer than having a good old heart to heart. I'm sure they understand women. Sybil. What darling? Do you know? Do you know? What he asked me just now? What? What? He asked me. It's interesting. It's much better that I do this by whispering. Ridiculous. Otherwise, we just be telling the audience what they already know. And but by whispering, we speed it up. Just like that. But what did he say? He said, <laughs> "Mangy." His wife said, "They're talking about holidays, Basil. I was just saying to them about how difficult it is to get any." Twice a year. I could have taken a little more time there, but I'm so wound up playing Basil in this state of panic that I, I uh, did that a little bit too quickly. Now there's the other gorgeous lady that I was talking about, the second of the three, and that's Luanne Peters. Holidays! Holidays! Ah! Sex! Ha ha ha! No, my wife and I have one about twice a year. I mean, a holiday, a holiday. Whereas, uh, so far as a good walk goes, well, we have a jolly good walk about two or three times a week, average. Well, we're just taking ours now. Thank you. Well, enjoy it. Uh, the walk. walk. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now you have a chance to see this gorgeous creature, as I said, Luanne Peters playing Raylene Miles. Tony Miles um, was out in Australia, was a friend of mine, an advertising agency. And we actually uh, auditioned for this part, which we almost never did, but we couldn't think of anyone we knew who was right for it. And uh, Luanne came in and was just perfect for it. Also, I think does an excellent Australian accent, which she's not Australian. Uh, first time uh, we ever auditioned and the last. Um, should have done it more often because I actually got a really nice girlfriend out of it. Suzanne Church, who I still see regularly. It's quite adorable. Very pretty. <laughs> yes, isn't she? Where did you put the order forms, Basil? Uh, down there, dear. Where? Uh, down here, dear. Um, oh, I and here comes the third gorgeous creature, Imogen Bickford Smith. More of her later. Keep number six, please. You're back early this evening, Mr. Johnson. Yes, well, got to be up early for mother. Thank you. See, we're just setting mother in again, so um, when the old lady emerges in the bedroom at the end, it's not a surprise, it's totally legitimized. Be quicker to train an ape! <laughs> Never... I love the way Andrew does this little bit of gormless wandering. Now that's Imogen, was always referred to as Immy. Frightfully upper middle class, but fun, nevertheless. And I had dinner with her three weeks ago. 
She was very naughty. She was inciting me to pick up a waitress. You are the English disgraceful. Uh, this is your bathroom. Here we are. Now, this scene, I think, is very well done. And Luan is, is very good. All this stuff that she does here sets up uh, why she goes and stands exactly where she does. The only thing about fast that is kind of silly is that the person who mustn't see what's happening always walks in at exactly, precisely the wrong moment, as Sybil does here. Just turn left out of the gate and straight on, and it's on your right. You see, when Basil does that, we know exactly what, what he's doing. And I love the fact that he looks down before he sees her. You left this downstairs. It's nice that she doesn't say anything and he runs after, and now she really kills him. It's pathetic, Basil. No, no, look, Sybil, I was reaching around for the switch. Don't right? bother. And look, look, the lights won't work in a bathroom, right? OK, so I went in, checked the fitting, which was loose. I've right? read about it, Basil, the male menopause, it's called. <laughs> oh, and one word of advice. If you're going to grope a girl, have the gallantry to stay in the room with her while you're doing it. Isn't that a wonderful line? And doesn't she do that absolutely perfectly? Now Basil's got an apology going on. And she's nice. She's Australian. They're the greatest girls in the world. Along with the Danes. And the Swedes. And the Norwegians and the Dutch. Turn left. Five minutes on your right. And the Canadians. And the Americans. Because I only marry Americans. It's a principle of mine. Pretentious! Moi! <laughs> I like the timing of the girls' giggle, though. That's Amy. Imogen Bickford Smith, sorry. Yes? Can I help you? Um, I was just wondering if I could get um, a drink now. A drink? Well, that's a very good move, but just as I step forward, he closes the door. It's a lovely little bit of uh, comedy, visually. No visitors in guests' rooms after 10 o'clock? Oh. Of the opposite um, sex? No, I wasn't. Ah. But I am now. See, Nicky plays this beautifully. He was a little bit flustered when he first came through the door because he really wasn't expecting me to be standing outside at six feet away, but now he's got back again. He just plays this with exactly the right balance of defiance and cheekiness and firmness. That's all I need, unless you care to join me. No, thank you. Not when I'm on the job. That's when I enjoy it the most. <laughs> I like those unattributable remarks. Hang on. What am I saying? One glass, quick. Mr. Forty, hmm? did you know there's a psychiatrist, Dean? Yes, yes, I did. Has he come for the major? What? Has he now, that's funny, but the rest of this goes on a little too long. I'm sure they have them in Birmingham, too. Just needed to speed that up, a fraction. Right, ladies. Oh, just coming. Won't be a moment. I like the fact that we see them come in the background. That's very fortuitous, but uh, very nice. Now, I love this running gag that we now establish of, of checking whether things are stable or not. Some will think about the way... No, that's OK. Fine. Well, sorry to disturb you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> I kind of feel that Nicky should have... Um, been directed to come to the door a little sooner. Uh, it's just coming. <laughs> Responding to the knock. It would have been funnier if we cued him just slightly earlier. Now, I like the fact that we see the bolt close, so we now know the first time the door is locked. And this is well done. I like the way that I managed to flip the bottle to Andrew there. It's really good. I'm sorry, I'll get you another one. An outro. Come down, come down, come down. Yes, fine, David. An outro, of course, is it out. And bumble it again. There you go. I love Basil Henson here, the way he's just watching me with his icy self control, just observing the madness. Forty! Yes. Here, here. What? I, I, I thought you ought to know.
What? There's, there's a psychiatrist in the hotel. Pure Western Superman, this. Oh, well, apparently he's, he's dressed up as a guest. I think it's one of the very best lines, and I should have reacted to it slightly more slowly. I think I should have been more surprised by that. Now we go back into the uh, doors opening and shutting and pure farce. Come. Oh, thank you. On the table, please. I think I should have been peering around the room just slightly earlier. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> I think the yes should have been to Nikki rather than to the rest of the room. Now, this is very nice. <laughs> you see how little Basil does, huh? Feel free, have it. I realized this years ago that when people observe madness, very little happens on their face. Their faces are very, very still. They just watch. And I got that from watching Candid Camera, that no matter how insane something was, people watching it never reacted. Yeah, nothing, nothing. I didn't know she was in here. I just came in to check the walls. Do you mind? Sorry. I thought you'd go down to the restaurant. Oh, I was just so tired. No, that's fine. Well, sorry to disturb you. Oh, bloody walls. <laughs> you all right now? What was that? Hmm? Uh, what? Uh, nothing, dear. Why was she screaming? What were you doing? What's well, going on? Uh, nothing. She thought there was someone in her room. Someone in her room? Yes, someone in her room. <laughs> have to charge her double then. <laughs> what were you doing? That's a lovely little stiletto to Basil's heart, that line. What were you doing in there? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Foley. I didn't realise it was you. That's all right. That's all right. I'll you see, and what's so nice about this, from a writing point of view, is that she's so friendly and decent and reasonable about it. Well, she's Australian. The great, great, nicest girls in the world. <laughs> now, I love the shadows here. This is just uh, beautifully set up by the uh, lighting cameraman. And this is well done because you see how we're assuming that Basil's going up to that room. You see, now we cut to the room again in a moment. <laughs> now we cut to the room and we assume the face is going to appear at that window. So when we see the window, we think it's the other room, you see. Now here, when I go into the cover-up, which is very good, I do it one too many times. There should just be three. It should be that one, that one. I should not do this one in front of my own face. I should have gone up there after the first two. Now that's a great guy. I like this very much now when he runs to get Sybil and completely drops Basil in it. And it's nice, because we see it coming, of course. But sometimes in comedy, that'll work. The audience knows what's going to happen, and they can just start enjoying it in advance. Uh, uh, he tried to see girl. What? He tried to see in room to see girl. She make him crazy. Come, come, come. It's very good, legitimate double entendre there in, uh, in Andrew's lines. And this is nice here. It reminds me of when Mariah comes into the courtroom in Fish Call Wonder and gives me a whack like that. Well, Mariah hit me much harder than Prue did. Prue's too nice, I told her last night. <laughs> now, this is beautiful. The way Andrew runs off, the way he's lit as he tears into the distance, it's a beautiful bit of camera work and lighting. What in God's name? What did you hit me for? How dare you? No, it should be harder. It should be harder. It's be better, though, Prue. Better than when you hit people with the umbrella. What were you doing up that ladder? Come on. I was trying to see the girl. What? Is that so strange? <laughs> Stop hitting me. Get away from this door and don't you dare try and come in here tonight. <laughs> now, that laughter there, was, you wonder what that was. It's because the set shook so much when she slammed the door. But it's not in shot, so... That was why the studio audience laughed. Now, I love this moment. Andrew digging his own grave. 
room. You crazy about this girl, okay? Okay, so you go out to try to look at her, and Mrs. Faulty, she go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was intending to do to Andrew at this point, <laughs> but <laughs> with the inevitability of all fast at the most ridiculous moment, somebody walks in to observe it. No, that's enough for tonight. All right, we're going with your training in the morning. <laughs> Basil does think fast, though. It's rather interesting, actually. He's from Basel. The idea that this is all part of training. <laughs> it's very good, that floor. Sorry, I missed the doors. Oh. Everything's all right? Everything, uh, normal? Yes. Fine. You. Well, I'll leave you to it then. I mean, uh, to go to bed. To sleep. To sleep, that is. A chance to dream. <laughs> well, have a good night. Uh, good night, sleep. Sleep well. Good night, and you. Thank you. Yes, I will. God knows where. <laughs> this is slightly odd. I think I might have done this differently. But it's okay. It's setting up the fact that he's thinking of spending the night in the... We don't actually know where he did spend the night, but maybe he was in there. I think he might have room, one room empty in the hotel. Though. Anyway, he's out there watching now, so... Central point of his life is frightened always of Seymour. I like the way that he cheats his way into the room here. It's so innocent. Yes, uh, all right, sir. Yes. Um, Sybil! I'm not speaking to you, Basil. No, could I just have my electric razor here, just for the guests? Thank you, dear. Look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> when I said I wanted to look at that girl, I wasn't talking about that, that brain something, the Australian girl. I was talking about a girl in the room next look to Look at the expression on her face. Isn't this perfect? That was the one I was trying to get a look at, not that Australian hayseed. Basil, you have eight hours to think of something. Is that really the best you can come up with? You don't believe me. Oh, go away. Right, I'll get... I'm gonna get... Her. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. Yes, you do that, yes. All right. Um. Come. Mr. Johnson, do you... Do you, you see, that's a surprise. That's nice. We thought, just for a moment, that that was going to be Basil, so that's good. I'll see you later then. Thank you. Okay, darling. Right, the game's up. <laughs> up there. A bit of game pie got stuck up there. Again, he's thinking fast. <laughs> Pathetic, there it is. That little look from Basil at the end of the scene just carries the energy on and over the cut into the next scene. It's a tiny little thing, but the audience probably won't notice it at a conscious level, but it just keeps the tension. Okay, okay. So that's nicely played too. And I have to tell you, I did not have the pleasure of um, putting that imprint on Luan Peter's right boob. That was done by one of the staff, a young fellow called Ian, who reported in after about four o'clock that he'd successfully accomplished his task. So I was very, very careful not to put my hand anywhere near her, because if so, it would have messed up Ian's beautiful paw print. Now, I don't know why I did that. I don't think that was quite right. I don't think that was necessary. So, 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 look, I'll tell her to go. Torrance, I'm going to get the other girl just to prove it to you, but I'll tell Miss Miles to, to leave. Out! It's a very nice little bit of set design there where I have to run up the steps as I get to the top there and then down again. A lovely little bit of eccentricity. Now, this is well worked, I think. And this is well worked, too, because he's going to get out of the room. Where is he going to go now? Now, there's one thing wrong here, and that's the shadow. You see where Basil's finger is there by the lock or by the knobs, and we don't see it so clearly just because it's shadow. And as you'll see um, later on, this sh show is something like 35 minutes long, so trying to get this all recorded in the two hours available, you can't get everything right. Now you see it's much funnier, now it's in the full light. Basil? 
And I like the way she knocks on the door, you see, that's funny. And, and then he's in the... <laughs> I was in the bathroom! It's nice that that checking thing is, is a little theme that goes on and on throughout the show. Dreams that a girl like this could possibly be interested in an aging, brilliantine, stick insect like you. It's very important when Prue has a very funny line like that, you see, that I am completely still when she delivers it. If I'd been moving around, the line wouldn't have been so funny. There's just moments when you've got to freeze so that the audience is not in any way distracted. When I put my hand on the... Better sound effect we could have put on that afterwards. Do you think I've got time to listen to any more of your hopeless lily liver jellyfish lies? They are not lies. I am Look, trying Why can't to... you be a man? If you want to grope for guests, why can't you at least be honest about it without making up some pathetic song and dance... Shut up! Oh, you've done it now. No, I haven't. I'm just going to. I'm fed up with you, you rancorous, quaffered old sow. I mean, his choice of words is very good, isn't it? You know, he's quite literate. He was quoting Hamlet just now to the psychiatrist for chance to dream. Now, this is a great setup. And now we go back to something that was set up in the first seven or eight minutes, which I hope the audience has forgotten about, but I hope the audience will remember at the crucial moment. What? Another bottle of champagne, perhaps? I thought you said you rather enjoyed it when you were on the I show. love the way Nicky plays this. Just so solid. And sort of rude, but just the right degree of rudeness and insolence. He never pushes it too far. Contradictory gender, that sort of thing. I lost the words there and sort of ad-libbed my way out of it. We didn't have time for a retake. It was okay. Oh, yes, of course, the little woman, eh? The only thing is, I, I thought you told my wife that you were single. I am. I see, so... So Nicky knows he's got me now, he just has to... has to play it through. Your mother. Oh, I see. This, uh, bit of crumpets your old mummy, is she? <laughs> now he's digging his own grave, isn't he? Deeper and deeper. And deeper. Mother Johnson, Mother Johnson, come out, come out. Where... See, I mustn't see it to the last moment. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, I'll and we've increased the embarrassment by having a a um, tableau in the background observing what's going on. Now, this is nice. This is a good moment. And of course, the psychiatrist come around at exactly the right time. And this is a nice movement here, like some demented mega cockroach. Now, should we just have left it there? The line, I'm on holiday, is a good one, but I, I think we went past the ending by about five seconds. And that, uh, that episode was 35 and a half minutes, and we're supposed to be doing 30, and that was what was so great about the BBC in those days. They just said, OK, well, it's 35. If it's funny at that length, we'll, we'll work around that. Because the moment that you go to a commercial company, then they're terrified about that, because they've got to get the commercials in at exactly the split second that they are contracted to be shown. Bless the BBC in those days. As I said earlier, we decided to start doing anagrams uh, when we got on the second series. I'm particularly fond of flay otters. There's two letters missing. Can you figure out what they are? What I like about this episode is it starts with a lot of people and it finishes with a lot of people. And in the middle, there's just four of us. Oh, it's a lovely part. Of the On the right, Anthony Dawes. Now, this um, this episode has got a lot of my favourite actors, uh, Anthony. And in the background, there, over his shoulder, you could see for a moment uh, that is Terence Connolly just putting food on the right in his mouth. Now, Terence um, was uh, in the very first episode with the builders. The guy who couldn't get his drink, and uh, was also in the first class cabin. One of the passengers at the end of Fish Called Wanda. I love his acting and use him as much as I can. Letting things get on top of this. And quite honestly, what's the point? Have you finished? And um, Terence there is sitting with June Ellis. 
That's Mr. and Mrs. Johnston. I use the name Johnston because of my old friend Ian Johnston, who wrote Fierce Creatures. With me. Well, I didn't notice at the start. You didn't notice at the start? No, oh, well, it was a sauce. I wasn't sure. So you ate half to make sure? I mean, this is just a wonderful example. Terrible, terrible service. And that is what this episode is all about. Relentlessly, it's about service and about complaining. As it's inedible. Well, only half of it's inedible, apparently. <laughs> Well, deduct half now, and if my wife brings the other half up during the night, we'll claim the balance of the law. Now, Terence, I think I'm right in saying it's got a nice wig on there. That's a little more generous in the hair department than he usually displays. So I've cut out butter. And there's Norman Bird, I mentioned, with the red waistcoat just there, and Stella Tanner on his left. It's all right. It's all bristle. No, no, no. And this is what the British way of complaining is, which is to moan to each other, and then when the uh, maitre d' walks by to say everything's just fine. I don't know how they get away. Because to complain to the English middle class is sort of act of rudeness, because they don't understand that you can complain without getting angry. You say something. Well, there's no point, is there? We just won't come here again. You see, that's what happens, because you don't complain. You just decide not to come here again. It doesn't give a chance for the hotel or the restaurant to fix it. And uh, as we pointed out in Video Arts, which were the management sales training film company that uh, Tony J started with um, me and Peter Robinson about 1972. In fact, when you get a complaint, it's a chance almost to win a customer for life because everyone's a little uncomfortable about complaining. But if you handle a complaint really well, they are so relieved and so, what's the word, impressed by the fact that their complaint has been taken seriously that, as I say, you can make them a customer for life. Well, you think I don't know? I mean, you only have to eat here. We have to live with it. Now, this is the other uh, great mistake that anyone makes dealing with a complaint, which is to complain back and not to take responsibility. Complaining to him! <laughs> Andrew does this just beautifully. What has he spotted in that salad? Now, this whispering is very nice. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I like back acting. It's very funny sometimes when you know exactly what's going on. That's, that's Andrew showing exactly what it is that's in the salad. They're coming, they're coming. Now, Terence in this episode, instead of trying to get a round of drinks, is trying to get his lamb. There's sugar in the salt cellar. Anything else? <laughs> is that marvellous? Anything else? Because this is the attitude of a lot of British hoteliers, which is that the guests are the ones who are causing all the trouble. In fact, I've often claimed that the motto of the British Hotel Association is, if it wasn't for the guests, we could run this place properly. Yes, yes, I'm getting them, I'm getting them. Uh, excuse me? Yes? I'm sorry, but do you think we could cancel our fruit salads? Well, it's a little tricky. Chef's just opened the tin. Oh. <laughs> this is a place that's run primarily for the convenience of the staff, which is true of many, many organisations. It's very hard for people, and I'm talking now with my video arts hat on, it's very hard for people running institutions to actually think of them from the point of view of the customers. It's the single most common mistake. Yes, I can cope, dear. Coping's easy, not pureeing your loved ones. That's the difficult part. Did you know Biddeford Bridge has all different sides? Now, it's nice that he doesn't get the plates to Terence Connolly and uh, to June Ellis. And the way that we do that is by staging this argument with uh, Sybil. I'll have them removed if they're bothering you. Otherwise, it would be hard to make it uh, believable that he would walk across the uh, the restaurant and not just give them the plates. But I think it's actually managed quite well. Now, this beautiful, beautiful, and extremely nice woman is Claire Nielsen. And her performance in this episode, it's in a sense a smaller part, but it's almost perfect. I just ask you to keep an eye on her in the scenes when we see her husband in a moment who's coming in. She's just marvelous. Everything is real. 
everything is perfectly, perfectly tailored to the needs of that particular scene. What? Your lambs will be getting cold, Mr. Johnston. Colder? If you'd like them warmed up, I get it. You could get your wife to sit on them. It's one of my favourite lines. I'm so sorry with the rubbish we get. Now, um, Claire Nielsen's uh, husband now comes in in the background. This is Bruce Boer. And Bruce's performance in this is just terrific because it is so powerful and confident and it is very, very, very hard on just five days rehearsal in front of a studio audience, which throws a lot of people because they do mess up your timing sometimes, to come in with a performance that is this confident and, and, uh, and powerful and at ease. And he never ever misses a beat he keeps up the pressure on basil just note he never is never 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 slow to pick up a cue he just keeps the pressure up all the time may i introduce my husband <laughs> oh the rubbish we get in here look at that basil covering up as we so often see him doing in fact about every three minutes that's what he's up to Basil. Yes, just eating with Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton, dear. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Manuel. Manuel, we'll, we'll bring your bags to your rooms. I hope you enjoy your stay and... Thank you. Do we need to reserve a table for dinner? Now, here we are. You see the British hotel that is basically run for the convenience of the staff. And also to keep the costs down. Well, look, if you could go straight in. Just I'm sure sure five hours to get here. We like to freshen up, maybe have a drink first, you know. Yes. Uh, you see, it just isn't convenient. It's not the way that this hotel works. Dinner, freshen up and go to bed. But if you could, it would make things easier for us. Shall we go to bed now? Would that make it easier for you? <laughs> <laughs> We're a little tired, fellow. We want to... One of the things that impressed me most when I first got to America was that there was a directness about the Americans, which I found very refreshing. You know, the middle class can't say, uh, pass the salt, please. They would say, I wonder if I could uh, just um, uh, bother you to the extent that you might consider the, the, the possibility that eventually it would not inconvenience you too greatly to pass me the salt. Gee, we want something hot. Toast is The Americans can be much more direct, and they can also be very, very direct emotionally, which I think is enormously helpful in good human relations. However, a lot of them, despite their directness, or perhaps because of it, do lack irony. And in the Middle West and the South, their kind of fundamentalist attitude to words, the fact that words are true and can't be said with any detachment or with any ironic intent means that a lot of the humor I do doesn't go down very well there. But the directness I've always liked and it's something I've tried to incorporate. Now, Basil Hughes is doing this nonsense because he knows this is um, something that Terry might not agree to. Just arrived right at the last moment, as usual. Typical. I'm sorry, but this puts us out just as much as it puts you out. Don't put me out, Mr. Foley. Uh, no, but they want some dinner, you see, and they insist first on scraping off some of the filth that somehow got Kate to them cruising down the M5. Well, I've got my class tonight, Mr. Foley. But Terry. You see, he's uh, he's negotiating. Basil doesn't know he's negotiating, but he is. You know, out of my own pocket. It's not the money, Mr. Forty. My karate means a lot to me. Right, half an hour's overtime in a taxi. Mr. Forty, if I miss a week, next week I don't get out in one piece. An hour's overtime. Sorry, Mr. I think Brian Hall is so good in this part because he's kind of... Two hours. You see, he's negotiating. He's just right for this part. I'm so glad we got him to play it. I can't think what you're going to say to your guests. Look, Terry, I'd pay you two hours overtime if I could afford it. Sorry, Mr. Fulton. He's still negotiating. An hour and a half. Cash? Cash. All right, hour and a half. But I go at half past nine, then I still get some of me class, right? Well, and I do the washing up. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Fulton. Yes, I know how it is. I pay you for an hour and a half. You clear off after half an hour. That's how it is. That's socialism. Oh, no. That's the free market. I like that, you see, because Basil is always attributing these um, wrong behaviours to socialism, and... Uh, Terry's made a very good point here. Now, we discover it's not karate, it's a Finnish bint. Well, it's a sort of karate, isn't it? Right, give me that. What? Oh. I'd pay you overtime to miss a class, not to keep some bit of crumpet hanging around. Yeah, but you... No, it's all right, I'm doing the washing up, I'll do the cooking too. I'm not so sure that this transition here by which he gets rid of Terry is um, written as convincingly as it might have been. I think we just about get away with it. What are you? Polly, what a, uh, wait for me. It's a slightly artificial movement for once from um, 
from Andrew, but uh, he was directed that way because we wanted to see how he looked. And if he'd run straight after them, we wouldn't have seen him from the front. Can sit over there? There's Claire Nielsen, who's just perfect, as I say. Just watch the performance occasionally, let your eyes go to her. Is your room to your liking? Yes, it's very nice. Very nice, thank you. Oh, good. I'll just get you tonight's menu. Oh, um, would you care for a drink before your meal? Let's catch one and a screwdriver, please. Now, the audience last year, they immediately get that Basil doesn't know what a screwdriver is. And, and I'm delighted that they got it so quickly because it makes everything that follows funnier. After meal. Well, now, please. There's nothing I can put right? What? Absolutely. So it's one scotch and a screwdriver. I think I'll join you. Make that two screwdrivers, would you? You'd like a screwdriver as well? No. Fine. So it's one scotch and you each need a screwdriver. No, 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 no. Forget the scotch, two screwdrivers. I understand, and you'll leave the drinks. What? <laughs> nothing to drink? What do you mean, nothing to drink? You see how quickly Bruce comes back at me each time, always keeping the pressure on me. You see, if he left pauses, the attention, in a sense, would come back to him. What's funny here is Basil's discomfort by Bruce giving me the cues back so fast it keeps the focus on where the humour is, which is Basil's discomfort. When you are there... I hope we're not intruding on your dinner hour. Oh, not at all, no. You're American. That's right. Where are you from? California. Oh, how lovely. You're English, though. Now, Claire at this point makes a, a speech which rather anticipates um, my behaviour, because in 1999 I basically transferred my, uh, my centre of gravity to California, to Santa Barbara, for the very reasons that she is now coming up with. Couldn't take this Harry finds it too gloomy. Oh, I don't find it too gloomy, do you, Sybil? Yes, I do, Basil. Oh, yes, my wife finds it too gloomy. I find it rather bracing. What do you find bracing, Basil? The damp, the drizzle, the fog? Well, it's not always like this, dear. It changes. My husband's like the climate. He changes. This morning he went on for two hours about the bloody weather. <laughs> Isn't that laugh wonderful there? It makes the line so much funnier. Uh, normally we're rather spoiled down here on the English Riviera. Mr and Mrs Hamilton were telling me about California. You can swim in the morning and then in the afternoon you can drive up into the mountains and ski. Must be rather tiring. I love that. That's the, the British putting America down, no matter how much sense it makes. And there is so much of that about the Californian lifestyle, because when they actually get out the Californian experience, that they rather like it. People used to come out to Santa Barbara and say to me, what, what, what are you living in California for? And then after about an hour of being driven around and showing how beautiful it is and how lovely the weather is and how everything pretty much works, the restaurants are good and there's amazing people visiting every week, giving speeches and playing music. I mean, we get some of the best musicians in America. And after about an hour, they say, OK, I get it. Oh, it's all right. It's just that back home, fresh orange juice comes like running water. Does it really? Of course, it's so good for your skin, isn't it? I'd love to go to California someday. Looks so exciting. Oh, never love a stranger. You see, that's how, uh, by the way she plays it, we now get on to Harold Robbins and the embarrassment that... Uh, Dear old Basil causes himself that. Seem to have the time when he's home. Who needs Harold Robbins when you got the real thing? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married, Mrs. Forty? Oh, since 1485. There we are, fresh orange juice. Thank you. <laughs> but seriously, though, his men are all so interesting, ruthless and sexy and powerful. Who's this then, dear? Proust, E.M. Forster. Harold Robbins. You see, this is my Cambridge education coming out here. We were supposed to disdain certain people. In some cases, correctly. <laughs> Have you ever read any? Oh, really is the most awful American, well, not American, transatlantic tripe, sort of pornographic Muzak. Still, keeps my wife off the streets. We will, thank him. <laughs> oh, Rob Robbins. What? Harold Robbins! Oh, I thought you meant that awful man. What's his name? Uh, Harold Robinson. Have you, have you read any Harold Robinson? And you see, the way that Bruce is playing this is very, very unselfish because he's making so little movement there and doing so little that he helps to keep the attention on Basil's speech, which is where the humour is in this particular moment. Oh, uh, uh, Waldorf Sound. Well, I think we're just out of Waldorf. <laughs>
It's lovely that that line gets such a big laugh. It's not very well known here, Harry. Yes, uh, may I recommend tonight... No, no. Again, this is the invariable uh, experience in this kind of hotel, which is that they have their system, and that is the only system that exists in the world at least in that hotel. And I notice that even staying in some of the great hotels or the most famous hotels, there's always a feeling that this is somehow the definitive hotel. This is how hotels are run. All other hotels' behavior, mere aberrations. And what is more, you should know how this hotel is run. I know we've just arrived here and we've just got the room, but you should basically understand that if you want the curtains to open, then you have to do them with the remote. 20 pounds to have some guy cut a grapefruit and half and stick a cherry in the center. Exactly. I want a Waldorf salad. Absolutely. One Waldorf salad. And a green salad for me. And one green salad, yes. And if we can't manage the Waldorf salad... I want you see, that's so good. It's exactly the degree of anger. Wonderful. Six, six. Done rare. Done rare. Not out of a box. See the speed, the pace. It's wonderful the way it keeps it going. Lifts the energy of the scene. May I ask, did you say you'd pay 20 pounds? Because comedy is so much about energy. If you drop the energy in comedy, it doesn't matter how funny the lines are. It's dead. Oh, sorry, he's forgotten already. Uh, walnuts, cheese... Now, this fantasy that uh, Terry's actually in the kitchen, I think we build up to it nicely. He doesn't go straight to it. You say that's the first time he pretends to shout to Terry. And then we build this fat. He gets more and more into this ridiculous situation and begins, in a sense, to kind of believe it or feel that he has to go along with it more and more. <laughs> I don't believe the way Basil's doing that. I think that's a bit silly. I think I should have just emptied it all out onto the table and sort of rummaged above uh, among it. I think it would have been a much better way of doing it visually. Terry, there's no great walnuts. That's a laugh. He's going to find a packet of sliced hippopotamus in suitcase sauce in the wall. <laughs> Now we've got apples. Oh, terrific. We'll celebrate. We'll have an apple party. Everybody brings his own apple and stuffs it on somebody's throat. <laughs> it is funny that when Basil gets this worked up, he see, it's always fear. It's not walled off anywhere. Walnut that's gone off. <laughs> the, hotel, Basil, the Waldorf Hotel in New York. Wait. Basil. I think I should have written the line with Connie there. Not, not so much Basil, but more, what, what are you up to, Basil? What, what are you going to do? Have you ever tried a Ritz salad? Ritz salad? Yes, it's a traditional old English thing. It's apples, grapefruit, and potatoes in a mayonnaise sauce. No, I don't think I ever tried that. Ah, don't think I ever will either. <laughs> Would it have been better if he just said, I don't think I ever will? About this ward off salad. Do we need the either? Um, if you put an extra syllable in. It isn't necessary. It always somehow softens the impact of the line in a way that makes it less funny. Brevity is the soul of wit, they said. It's certainly the soul of scriptwriting comedy. But this week, um, the driver... That's a fault, he... Yes, he was putting the crate into the van... I'm not ...and he sort of slipped forward... And, and this again, you see, is a perfect example of the, the... As the Americans say, this is information they don't need. But these kind of excuses about why service is not good must never, ever, ever be given. So, makes you think how lucky you are. I remember that, because one of the first films I ever wrote for video arts was about the art of complaining. If you've got your health... What else matters? What a bunch of crap. This is what we call directness and very... Look at him, wonderful, the energy. Is this a hotel or isn't it? Well, within reason. You know something, fella? If this was back in the States, I wouldn't board my dog here. Fussy, is he? Poodle? Oh. <laughs> Poodle. I'm not getting through to you, He am keeps I? the energy up. He never lets it drop. You know, I stay in hotels all over the world. And this is the first time I've had to bribe a chef to cook me a meal and then find out he doesn't even have the basic goddamn ingredients. Holy cow, can't you see what a crummy dump this is? You listen to this, are you? You see, what's so good about that line is he's trying to deflect it and, you know, avoid responsibility. Yes, I see what you mean. And then you give me some half-assed story about some delivery guy busting his arm. Now look, Foley, if your chef couldn't find the ingredients from that guy, why didn't he get them from somebody else, huh? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See, again, the British thing is joining in the complaint. The, the, the way to handle a complaint is do something about it. It's the only rule, handling complaints. Don't justify, just apologize. And then, when you've apologized briefly, do something about it. I'll tell you. No, 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 I'll tell you. Leave it to me. I've got it. 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 <laughs> Busty's... It's always amused me in America, the number of phrases that have the word ass in them. Just extraordinary.
Bust his ass, move his ass, get your ass over here. He's a horse's ass, got his ass in a sling. It's just extraordinary. You sometimes feel that it's uh, the only way they can communicate is to talk about asses. You hear me? It's not good enough. Now, it's nice, you see, that uh, Sybil's out of the room now. Otherwise, she'd have to go in there and tell him to pull himself together. So this scene where he's pretending to shout at Terry has to be conducted in Sybil's um, absence. And the moment she comes back in the room, it stops, you see. It's one of those little, did you spot that audience? Did you spot it? Oh, um, you're a chef. Yes. Uh, has he been with you long? About six months. He used to work at Dorchester. At the Dorchester? No, in Dorchester. I like that little thing, that little uh, misunderstanding there. <laughs> Basil. Yes, sir. Mr. Hamilton has his Wardorf salad, dear. No, dear, chef couldn't make it. He didn't have the ingredients. I just uh, smashed his backside about it. <laughs> but there it is. What? There's the Wardorf salad. Chef found the ingredients. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think this is terribly funny. Maybe Robinson's arm got And that's a perfect tone, that uh, sort of amused contempt from Bruce. Good line. <laughs> you see, Basil is so, so tied up in trying to save his own ego all the time, trying to keep his dignity. He cannot see where the simple solution lies. I mean, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me you found them, you stupid cow? <laughs> so, now he's calling the mythical Terry a cow. I think we know why he got confused there. Chef hasn't been with us very long. Now, was the bang of her hitting him noticeable enough? I think so. Because now... Move your moment. Now that he comes out covering his recent injury we get it has chef put the steaks on yet no i'll, I'll tell you right is your husband all right you see that's so utterly believable the way she does that line it's genuine and it just keeps the whole thing going she's so good claire i have to get away occasionally just for a few hours even if it's just down to the hairdresser or a round of golf yes this is sybil's life girls Drive in the country sometimes, just on my own. Yes, it's not Basil. Cornwall for the day, sometimes it's beautiful there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just find that hat a really, really good choice of hat. <laughs> Now, Bruce, the only thing in his performance, he should have stared at the hat longer there. He should have just done, done the double take and then gone on staring at the hat. Look, don't let it bother you. Anyway, this one is... He can't let it go. He's feeling foolish and he has to put it right. And all he has to do is shut up. I do apologise personally, but I didn't want him wasting your time. Wonderful. Claire's reaction so believable. Absolutely perfect. Just keeps the tone of the scene there. Full responsibility for the dreadful mess ups tonight. If I only listen to Mr. Faulty, none of this fiasco would have occurred. But I'd just like to tell you that such a cock up has never occurred in my career. Oh, I think this is so well done. There he is, digging his own grave. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I haven't seen it for 30 years. You do realise that's why I'm laughing. What do you mean you found it? Now, this is a great moment. This is a really great moment. How could you forget about it? What was my It's so... It is so funny, as you can tell from the audience's reaction, that we can hold it. He can go on and on doing this with Bruce. Now he sees him. <laughs> Look at the way Bruce holds this. Mr. Hamilton, may I introduce Terry Hill? <laughs> Where did he go? Where's he gone? Did you see him? Maybe he went to get something to eat. And Bruce's stillness there was perfect. You see, he didn't need to do any more than that. Well, what's happened? I'll tell you later. And now we come to the last part of this, which involves getting all that large number of guests that we open the show with back into the action. 
You know, after all, all the problems we've... <laughs> See how little he's doing here, and we just know what he's feeling. Do you think I don't know what's been going on out there? Oh, bit of a day bark, I'm afraid. I'm talking about you taking 20 pounds off me to keep the chef on, letting him go, cooking the meal yourself, and then pretending he's still out there. Oh, that? Yes, that. And I'd be interested to know what you've got to say about it. Good evening. I asked you, you see, they hear the noise, so they're all beginning to come out and see what's going on. This evening? <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that this place is the, the crummiest, shoddiest, worst run. I love this line coming up here. No! No, I won't have that. <laughs> There's a place in Eastbourne. I think that's a very funny line. Bruce picks it up at exactly the right moment. Now, look, I, I know things ha have gone wrong this evening, but you must remember that we have had thousands of satisfied customers. All right, let's ask them, eh? What? Let's ask now, you see, Bruce is now turning them from mouse-like English being super polite, not saying what they need to say, into the um, correct and very effective American attitude, which is that you can complain. You can complain politely and without anger, but you just complain firmly. You say you're not satisfied. Of course, if this little hotel... And it's Terence Colony there, moving up in the shot. Now, this is this is very, very nicely done from the point of view of Bobby Spears, our director. Very nice. You see, we're looking at Terence Colony now, aren't we? Although Basil's talking, we're aware that that's where the, that's where the energy is. A far, far more important... I'm not satisfied. ...than many of the... What? I'm not satisfied. No, we're not satisfied. Well, people like you never are, are you? And that's believable that she is the next one. That June Ellis is the next one to join in the complaints. That gives them all courage, you see. Man I've ever met. I haven't started yet. <laughs> you're not going to. You're going to stand here nice and quiet while these people say whether or not they're satisfied and you move off that spot, Faldy, and I'm going to... Fuck so Bruce has now created the atmosphere in which they can actually say what they think. Everything's bottomed, isn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think this is probably the worst hotel we've ever stayed in. Yes, it is. The service here is an absolute disgrace. I agree. You do? Yes. So she's the next most likely to want to speak up, and that, of course, means that dear Norman Bird, who wants everyone to love him, he could finally, finally speak up. The rules were off, and when I told him, there was an argument. And heard me... Now, finally, these two. Miss Girk and Miss Hare, Beatrice Shaw and Dorothy Freer. Now they're speaking up. Customers, huh? Ha, ha, ha. Basil's been told the truth. So what does he do? This is typical. He blames everyone else. Absolutely typical. The kind of ass! Wonderful reaction. Put up with from you people! You punts in here expecting to be hand-weighted on hand and foot while I'm trying to run a hotel here! Have you any idea? I love the major's reaction. You see, just thinking it over. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably true. No emotional reaction at all. Yeah, that's interesting. Poking about for things to complain about, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something. This is exactly how Nazi Germany started. Huge reaction from the audience. Funny, I never thought that line would be that funny. Well, I've had 15 years of pandering to the likes of you, and I've had enough. I've had it. Come on. Pack your bags and get out! They're packed! Order ten taxis, we I'll pay for them! Come on, come on! What? what? Out! Everybody out! <laughs> come on upstairs, pack your bags, and your... Out! Ballard Barkley says out! Oh, all right, old boy. Too late now! Come on out! Rouse! 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 I just noticed uh, that, um, that June Ellis has uh, got her foot in a, in a plaster cast. I cannot remember why that was. Interesting, we never bothered to write a line about it or have her say anything. And maybe that's fine because it doesn't really notice, it doesn't intrude. No, I think this is a nice bit of plotting now. He's decided he's he's gonna leave. It must come to an end. I hope you enjoy your new work here helping to run a hotel. That's a good line. Your new work here helping to run a hotel. You've forgotten your keys, Basil. Very good, very good. The calmness with which she says that good. She's not the slightest bit bothered. Hesitate to tell my wife. Any hour of the day or night, just shout. And now we realize that suddenly something's happened that he hadn't counted on. <laughs> this is very nicely shot and very nicely lit. Ten minutes, that'll be fine. 
Now, this is a very good twist, I think. Hello, dear, I'm back. What do you want, Basil? A room, please. Um, number 12 is fair, I think. Now, I'd like breakfast in bed at half past ten in the morning, please. That's eggs, bacon... And there we should be winding it up. Uh, but the laughter of the audience at that moment winds it up for us. I must say, I hadn't seen that episode for 30 years, and I laughed a lot. And many thanks to Bruce Bowers and Claire Nielsen for just being the perfect, perfect companions for dear Prunella and me in that scene. Because if you think about it, Terry, one scene, uh, we hardly saw Andrew, and Polly had about five lines. So it was a very atypical episode. But that's sometimes what happens. You get an idea and the idea takes it over and that's the way it had to be written. I think Fatty Owls is a very, very good anagram. And this is one of my very favorite episodes because it involves dead bodies and there's a great, great English tradition. Uh, going back to Robert Louis Stevenson and The Wrong Box. Now, I think dead bodies are very, very funny. And to play the dead body, we got an expert farceur, Derek Royal, who's just wonderful at being dead. And he loves peckons and walnuts, and he simply adores those little cheese footballs. Now, this is Mavis Pugh playing Mrs. Chase with one of those horrible little dogs that don't qualify as dogs, as we know. They're just slightly larger, hairy insects. Which is why I was able to kill them with impunity in Fish Called Wanda. Nobody thought for a moment that it mattered that these little creatures were being exterminated. Imagine him stalking a reindeer, what? <laughs> uh, Major, can I get you another one? Uh, why not, why not? Good for you, Mr. And therefore you can do almost anything horrible to them, like um, Polly and, and uh, Andrew in, and, and Manuel in this episode uh, do dreadful things to that little dog, and one never cares. Uh, Manuel, um, por favor, el perro microscopico. Hmm? <laughs> oh, good evening. Now, this is Geoffrey Palmer, whom I absolutely adore. I must have worked with Geoffrey a dozen times, most recently in the second Pink Panther that Steve Martin was making. We worked together in Boston a few months ago. I actually asked him, or rather asked them, if we could have Geoffrey for the scene, because I love acting with him so much. And he appeared in many of the video arts training films, and if you saw Fish Called Wanda, he played the judge. Here we are, Major. Excuse me, ah. Found another draft, have we? We have to be very careful, Mr. Faulty. He's not very strong. Indeed, yes. A rapid movement of air could damage him irreparably. If, um, <laughs> if only one could keep them in air... You see, Basil is quite literate. That's a very literate thing to say, and we believe that he can say things like that. It's just his emotional intelligence that's at fault. Now, on the right here, we have uh, an unlikely couple, and it's about the only time in the uh, 12 programs that we actually pulled that, that sort of gag. No, no, she was the one he had with him the third time. The first one was the dowdy And this is very good casting by Dougie Argent and uh, the lovely Bobby Spears, who directed the last six, the second series. I like the way he's playing that. You see, they're not making any more of it than they need to. Now, here we have the wonderful Derek Royal, the guy who dies, with his friends, who we see at the end when they come to pick him up. So we kind of establish them, and we're, we know that they are his business colleagues. Now, he looks marvelously ill, so makeup did a terrific job here. And going to the MD at 10. Fine, thanks. Okay. He's a really nice man, but his energy's not good. He doesn't feel well, and he just plays it perfectly. And although he's only got the one scene with dialogue, He's then absolutely wonderful as the court. I mean, just look at it. One accepts that he's dead. And that's incredibly skillful. Are you feeling all right? Uh, not too good, no. Oh. Now, Sybil actually shows some sort of concern here, which is very nice as far as Basil is concerned, of course. He's just another inconsiderate guest. I said good night. <laughs> oh, good night. Didn't hurt, did it? <laughs> 
Good manners cost nothing, no? He's not feeling very well, Basil. You only have to say good night, yeah? It's not the Gettysburg address, is it? <laughs> it's odd that um, Basil has these little bits of general knowledge. One might think that he'd never had time to read, but he obviously has picked up something. It's just he doesn't know anything important or at any depth. Of course, Mr. Lindsay. Oh. Yes, we can manage that, can we do Yes, that? we can. I'll pull you back. Yes, is it your legs? And so, well, most of our guests managed to struggle down in the morning. You see, here we are, a hotel run for the convenience of the staff. Continental. Oh, I, I don't Our think. chef does a very good for breakfast. Eggs, bacon, sausage, tomato, fried bread. The Continental. Uh, you wouldn't care for kippers? Oh, fine, kippers, yes, thank you. Toast, butter, marmalade. Yes, thank you. Tea or coffee? Yes. The, uh, tea, thank you. A newspaper? The Telegraph. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Rosewood, mahogany, tea. <laughs> I beg your pardon. What would you like your breakfast tray made out of? <laughs> I don't really mind. Are you sure? Fine. Well, you go along and have a really good night's sleep then. I'm hoping to get a couple of hours later on myself. But I'll be having good time to serve you your breakfast in bed. If you can remember to sleep with your mouth open, you won't even have to wake up. I'll just drop in small pieces of lightly buttered kipper when you're breathing in the right direction, if that doesn't put you out. It's a wonderful tirade, isn't it? <laughs> it's good writing. Sausages, please. Just I love this Geoffrey Palmer. But he's... No, no, not a saucer. Come on. I said a bowl. A boy? Yes, and not cold like that. That's too cold. I said tepid, didn't I? Mas grande, Manuel. De agua caliente. Ah. Catch pneumonia after that. And because, of course, these are not dogs to these dappy women. They are, in fact, their children. Although they um, actually treat them with far more care, love and consideration than they would ever treat a human child. In the fridge. Now, it's nice to note that uh, this business about the date on the kippers is, uh, is just laid in here because of its consequences. <laughs> On the table, on the table. No. <laughs> that. Now, put that under him. <laughs> the cushion, the cushion. Now, Andrew's done all that so beautifully. The misunderstanding is just effortless and so simple. You don't really notice it. You don't just realize how beautifully and skillfully he's done it. Don't you have dogs in Calcutta? <laughs> Excuse me, but I have an order for eggs and sausages for this table. Oh, yes. The sausages are for him. Oh. What's the matter, Manuel? He bite me. Cut them up. Cut them up into little pieces. You see, this is uh, Polly getting her own revenge. She knows exactly what she's my doing. Eggs, not my eggs, the sausages. Sorry. <laughs> ah, he bite Polly too, you see. If dogs are allowed in the dining room, at least the staff should know how to handle them. That's exactly the kind of rationale that a woman like that would have. <laughs> Get us ready. Oh, he hurt you, Polly. Oh. Basil, what are you doing? Do you know when the six was, Sybil? I think we needed to lay this little bit of plot in a second time. Well, it's supposed to be done. Basil, oh. will you just take it up? What's the matter, Mambo? Oh. That hairy mosquito just bit us both. What? Now, what is, what's Polly up to there, you see? It would be better if... The composition of that earlier shot, those things weren't in line in our eye line between the camera and the plate. Just one of those small things which, of course, in a movie you'd simply do a retake. In television, there just isn't time. The only reason that these shows look pretty smooth is that we did an enormous amount of editing on them. Um, one of these shows took somewhere between 20 and 25 hours to edit. That's for every minute on the screen we spent the best part of an hour editing it. Now, I like this bit. I mean, De Derek is just terrific. Look at that. Look at the way he flops there. And, of course, it is funny because Basil's so much in his own world, he wouldn't notice something like this. And when he does notice it, he takes it as rudeness. This is someone who takes very, very little in. As somebody said about a friend of mine recently, he's always on transmit. I'm not interested in anything except lounging about in conveyor belts, stuffing themselves with my money. You don't mind if I turn the light off? Well, enjoy your breakfast. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that marvellous, the way he does it? <laughs> oh, not at all. Thank you for mentioning it. Do you see the picture shake when I close the door? The set is not very strong. In the morning, so they lounge around in bed till midday. Do you get so much as a word of thanks? What's that? Forgot the milk. 
Well, don't get talking to him. You never get away. Now, it's nice. The audience are way, way ahead of Basil. So it's very, this is all good stuff because there's a kind of tension in the air. We know that he's going to realize what's happened fairly soon. And in the meantime, that tension in the air is going to buy us time. It's like uh, somebody once said to Alfred Hitchcock, how could you, how long could you hold a screen kiss? And Hitchcock replied, that all depends on whether you'll let me put a bomb under the bed first. With the right mechanism, you can keep a certain tension. Now, nobody's going to go to sleep now because they know that there's a, a bomb, a metaphorical bomb about to explode. Now, what I like about this bit of shooting by our lovely director, Bobby Spears, is by starting on that closer shot the sausages, he kept the pace up. We wanted to move the story on a little bit. We didn't want a period of, of, of um, sort of hanging there, a longer. And Andrew has poured the salt on the sausages, so they have to be cooked again. What's the matter with that dog? He is. But starting on the sausages in that way just kept the pace up. Now, these guys, look at that. Terry is. It's, you see how little he's doing and how perfect no, it is. No, Mr. Lehman, dead. Well, that would explain a lot. Mm. No, Mr. <laughs> really? Paul just said so. What do you want about? I just took him his kippers. Incidentally, the reason why the corpse is called Mr. Lehman is that the idea for this episode was um, given to me by a good old friend of mine called Andrew Lehman, who sadly, I'm so sorry to say this, is no longer with us. He was a great restaurateur and a very good friend of mine, and he trained at the Savoy. And one day when I was with him, I said to him, Andrew, what was the worst problem we've ever had at the Savoy? And he, without batting an eyelid, he said, oh, getting rid of the stiffs. I, and I said, thank you, you've just given me an episode. What? Feeling. <laughs> now, this is nice because, of course, he's so full of relief that his behavior becomes completely inappropriate. And, of course, just as he's behaving inappropriately, in walks the authority figure, because that's what happens in fast. So <laughs> Now, I really love this next bit, by which Jeffrey, by a process of quiet but relentless logic, uncovers what's happened. I was bringing him up the milk and we'd forgotten it. You brought the milk with the breakfast? No, the breakfast was already up. <laughs> well, who brought the breakfast? Who found it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I it. What's that? Um, now, was it clear enough that that was the kipper, that he tried to throw it out the window and it bounced back off the window went to the floor? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't clear enough. In a movie, we'd probably go in on a tighter shot. Well, then, why did you bring him... <laughs> why did you bring him the milk, then? And look. Why? Just look at Derek he Royal. Every time the camera's on him, it's a wonderful performance. Well, he didn't exactly say he was dead, Doctor. Well, I said he was pretty quiet. Look at him. Quiet? Exactly. What were you talking to him about, Basil? Car strikes. She knows Basil, doesn't she? Thank you, Sybil. I don't understand. He's been dead for about ten hours. That's a funny line. I think that I love the the way that the line it sort of normally follows death. It's a fun, isn't it? And it, just putting it in there in a completely inappropriate context makes it funny. If the guest isn't singing, oh, what this is a good speech. Immediately think, oh, there's another one snuffed it in the night. Another <laughs> name in a forty towers book of remembrance. I mean, this is a hotel, not a Burma railway. That's, well, I mean, he does actually. There he is, blaming everyone else as usual. He's a great, great blamer. This is an Olympic gold medal blamer. What are, you, what are you looking at me like that for? This is very good. Basil. It's a beautifully shot, too. You see, if we'd gone to a close-up too soon there, it would have been like underlining a joke in print. It was beautifully shot and directed. Uh, we'll be downstairs, Doctor. Shall I ring the undertaker? Uh, would you, Polly? I've been up since 5.30, you know! <laughs> Now, that was a good cut. You notice how the pace is kept up. You know, we jumped about 15 seconds of real time, but by cutting it like that, we keep the pace up, which is important. I don't think I should have thrown the uh, the kipper like that. I think I should have just sort of tossed it in there rather than throwing it. I don't think that was a, a good bit of acting. What are you doing? Making up his... Oh, uh, you see how wonderfully practical she is. We'll leave it in his wallet. They're bound to look there. You better not charge him for breakfast. <laughs> Mr. Simpkins? Forty towers here. I'm afraid somebody. Now, this is a very important bit of plot. When could you collect the body? 
Somebody? Anybody, really? Good morning, good morning. Oh, you're very cheerful this morning, Mr. Fawlty. Yes, well, one of the guests has just died. <laughs> That's a very good moment, isn't it? Now, that's nice that, you see, I shouldn't have thrown it in. I should just put it on the basket in there. Yes, if you oh, can. Would it, would it be all right to move Thank the... You. To move? Now, what did I do with the kipper? I didn't get that right. That wasn't good, that bit of business. The audience laughed, but we didn't get it right. Never mind. I'm not his doctor. I have to report his death to the coroner. Now, we're uh, 14 minutes into the episode, and now we've got to the core of the comedy, which is what do we do with a body? <laughs> Good morning. This will keep us going for the next 17, 18 minutes. Leave it, no, leave it to Terry. Oh, no, it's quite all right. Put the line No, no, don't bother. We can manage. Oh, it's no bother. I like the way that she's responsible for knocking the, uh, the camouflage off. And she does this very well. Ah! He's dead! <laughs> it's it's all right, Mr. Now, Polly hits her well here. She hits her well. What? Oh, she's hysterical. Slap her. <laughs> Beautifully shot. So much better just to see her head disappear backward in that close shot than if we'd gone wide to see her fall. So much funnier. I think she should have fallen more randomly, though. Those legs and arms are just a little bit too neat and military. Now, over here on the right, Connie's staging a diversion really nicely. There it is. Oh, sorry, I'm in your way. Now, I think there should have been a moment when they, she suddenly real. Oh, no, she's realized that. That was very good. That, that, that this is their room, the one that can't go in. Yes. <laughs> Did you enjoy your breakfast? Oh, yes, thank you, yes. Uh, at Tuesdays, do you think we could just go inside and get a... Not really. He should have kept talking there, Richard Davis. I love his acting, but he, he stopped for a moment uh, before Connie's line. He should have kept talking into it. It's a mistake that is very easy to make. Excuse me. Mr. Forty? Mr. Fawlty! But I've always liked working with Richard Davies. He's terrific. We've done several things together. And his wife there, Elizabeth Benson, also a terrific actress with a lot of strength. She's very good in this episode. Wait a minute! I like those little uh, strangled noises you get from out of vision, you know, when people are in distress and all you hear is the noise they make. Yes, probably five minutes. But couldn't you do it later? Um, pick that ash trap, will you, Manuel, please? The big one. Um, could, you, could we do it later? When we've got our things. Well, it'll only be a couple of minutes. Look, That's oh, good. You see how he, he, he raises the energy and his insistence without getting too angry. Very well judged. Oh, well, that's just a precaution. But now he's had enough. Have you locked this? I like the uh, Basil's line. He's so obviously carrying something. <laughs> What's going on? Well, he's a bit of a perfectionist. Ready? What's been going on in here? I do think the next two or three minutes are as good as anything we've done. Manuel has your coats. It's all right, he's from Barcelona. <laughs> I think we should have gone on singing a fraction longer, but it's still very good. Oh, yes, that's all. No, no, it's coming from the cupboard. Well, you see, Richard is not too insistent. He's not unpleasant, but he's, he's concerned. He wants to figure this out. It's exactly right. Keeps the pressure on me. Good Lord, so there is. Let them out. Good idea. Right. Well, um, well, go on. Yes, we're going to do it. It's the next thing on the list. Oh, um, if you do it, a chance. This, this is very funny. I think trying to get him out of there, though. Now, I love this moment. This is perfect. This is the best moment in Basil and Manuel. Do you have any idea, Polly Manuel? I expect we've left it downstairs somewhere. Okay. Where's the key? <laughs> <laughs> that little fight there is so perfect. Oh, well then, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Well, right. Good old Richard. He's in there. Richard Elizabeth keeping the pressure on me. We're trying to get her out. Now, when this comes out and the arm drops out, when does that happen? Any moment, you see? Derek Royal is waiting for the moment to put his arm out. Isn't that perfect? Now, Polly spotted it. That's why she goes in the cupboard. Exactly. Are you feeling better? Her arm gets stuck there. It's always happening to her. He's dead. This is her husband. She hasn't got over it. Died 30 years ago. She doesn't mean any arm. You see, that's great. <laughs> I love the... <laughs> I saw pretending he's killing something. 
<laughs> and Manuel doesn't quite get what it's about, but he's joining in anyway. Thank you, Manuel. That's enough. That's very successful. We do those little things sometimes, those little dying falls at the end of scenes. And apart from the fact that the fade to black should have come about a second and a half earlier, that was a very, very good scene. With its hand? Oh, I know. Now you have a little... She's very good here. She's really good here. Well, he was dead, dear. A man is a man, Mrs. Fawlty. Oh, I know. I should speak to him about it. Speak to him? To Mr. Fawlty, where his oldest residence. Well, have a little rest first. Frightening me like that. I shall speak to him. Have a word with him in a little while when you're feeling better. Mm -hmm. I see, yes. Thank you. It's all right, dear. They've got rooms at the Sea View. Tonight? Yes. Well, let's have a look at it. Yes, and if that's no good, we'll try the one up by the... Park. Now, that's a very weird line. I think I, I wrote it just to amuse friends, because you don't really hear it. He says it as he goes into the distance, but it's completely inappropriate prophylactic emporium. Now, look at... Did you see when Derek went in the chair, then he didn't flinch at all, and we actually slightly banged him. He's superb. Am I? There's no sign he's breathing at all. Now, Ballard Barclay is just wonderful here, of course. He doesn't look quite a ticket. Well, Major, um, don't say anything to anybody, but he's dead. Ah. Shot, was he? Military background. No, no, died in his sleep. In his sleep? Ah, well, you're off your guard, you see. He's wonderful. He's just wonderful. Uh, let him lie around here, you know. No, 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 the undertakers are coming to get him. Ah, because they attract the flies, you see. He's been out, hasn't he? Guarding the British Empire. Look, I've been waiting in there. What? I haven't had any breakfast yet. Oh, uh, right, sorry. Uh, come in, come in. Now, uh, look how beautifully shot that is, you see. She comes into picture in the background. We see it because there's movement, so our eye goes to it. No need to cut to a shot of her. The background is much funnier. And the same applies in a moment to the sound. Sorry about the delay, Doctor. Normal service has been resumed as soon as possible. <laughs> now, you hear a scream. The audience laugh uh, covered it up a little bit. But that's much funnier in the distance. If uh, Bobby Spears had gone and actually shot on her with another camera, it wouldn't have been so funny. So that's beautifully directed. But again, I wish she wasn't lying quite so sort of neatly. I wish she was a bit more splayed, because it looks as though she's been laid there rather than she's fallen there. This a tiny point. Uh, Derek is wonderful again. Look how he sags. And this is a nice moment. I like that moment very much. Sometimes when people change direction like that, without the slightest beat, without the slightest moment, of change or hesitation it's very funny now this is a bit clumsily done you see because we go back we didn't need that shot we didn't need that shot <laughs> we should just have put a crash on here and it would have been much more effective seriously oh dear well don't just stand there now i like the fact that she's so obsessional she doesn't notice anything that goes on and this is marvelous this is funny putting him on here Polly puts the stuff in the in the basket, the, the smoke from the sausages, and here's Jeffrey. He hasn't seen the body yet, but now he does. <laughs> oh, you can't keep a dead body in here with us food, can we? Of course. Not. Again, you see, the, the he's strong uh, in his indignation, but he's not over the top, so it's completely believable. In the kitchen. Oh, right. And we could have, I think we should have given uh, one or two of them little head injuries. I, I think we didn't have time to do that quite properly. Easier on movies, you just do it again. Oh, um, Seymour! Look at that look, isn't that funny? Basil, how are you feeling, dear? Uh, won't be two minutes, okay? Sorry about that, Doctor. Wash your hands first, please. Oh, right. And make sure this area is scrubbed before any more food is prepared in here. Absolutely. Sausages accepted, you may cook them immediately. I'll take the risk. <laughs> now, this is one of my favourite moments in, in the series. Perfect. Watch, just watch these two. I'm not going to say anything. Leave it. No, no, it's not time, please. No, 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 please. I'm sitting here. There's no lunch till 12. I'm still having breakfast. <laughs> it's finished. All gone, breakfast kaput. I'm having sausages. <laughs> That's wonderful. Not allowed. Put that back. <laughs> 
Look, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor and I want my sausages. I tell you, he's finished. Bye-bye, please. Bye-bye. <laughs> This couldn't be any better. Come on, come on. No, it's not possible. <laughs> is, is everything all right? He wants to eat now. I've been trying to sit down. He keeps moving things from my table. I'm so sorry. He doesn't seem to understand that I haven't... Now, the poke in the eye that's coming up, I stole from Terry Thomas in a, in a, a movie in uh, the mid-50s. And I always thought it was terribly funny. And those things I seemed to file away, even in the days before I was in the uh, in the business of comedy professionally. Now, this is Charles McEwen, a good friend of ours. He's been in a lot of Python projects. He's written several of Terry Gilliam's films with him. And he's playing Mr. Ingram's. And I'll explain a little thing about that later. Now, there's a good, legitimate misunderstanding here. Mr. Lehman. Do you know where he is? Where he is? Um... <laughs> Would he be in the dining room? Could have been a bit smaller there. That was bigger, that reaction, than it should have been. Now, I love the way that Andrew picks up uh, my body language here. To collect him. Well, it's been taking him to... Sorry? Now, this is a genuine misunderstanding. I mean, it's a good one. It's a valid one. So now Basil thinks they must be from The Undertakers, right? Modern dress. What? Your dress is very modern. I didn't realize women did it. Did what? He's downstairs. No, no, in the basket. I think we could have got in for a closer shot there, but the problem in television, you've only got the four cameras. Hello. What's, hmm? What's he doing in the basket? That's very funny. It's one of my favorite actors, Raymond Mason, that was. And here's Bob McBain, who I worked with an enormous amount in uh, video arts films. And with them is Pamela Buchner, who's done a, this is a great performance from her. You know, you could almost not notice it. Everything she does is right. Look at that. Look at the reactions. They're perfect, you see. Perfect reactions. Now, this is a good gag. And uh, considering this was all shot before the uh, second series started, the uh, style of it fits very well into the acting, the actual uh, studio stuff. Very good, those two little close-ups of Jeffrey and of the old lady. Oh, 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 it's all right. It's all right. We sorted it out. He's in this one. Oh. Now, to develop it now, of course, the next stage has got to be that Basil realizes that they're not undertakers. Yes, you do work here. Yes. Well, we'd like to speak to the manager. Well, I'm the manager. Is there a problem? <laughs> Well, he is, really. No, um, uh, there seems to be some kind of misunderstanding here. We've come to collect one of your guests, a Mr. Lehman, to take him into town for a meeting. Now, it's cover-up time. With our managing director. Look at Andrew down there on the basket. Mr. Lehman, yes. We thought you said the Lenny... I like that brilliant, that moment. But he should have shut up. But he was so pleased with the quality of the excuse, he couldn't contain himself. Look at Andrew. They were coming for Mr. Lehman, and we thought that they were coming to collect the linen. Mr. Lehman? Yes, so if you just sort that one out, dear, I'll take the linen upstairs, okay? I see. Thank you, Basil. Not at all. Now, of course, I have to tell you, he's not in the basket there, thank God, because we didn't have to see him during that sequence. Now he's back in the basket. We edited that together. I don't think Andrew and I could have got him up the stairs all the way. Now, this is a joke because there was a critic called Richard Ingrams who had something to do with Private Eye. And Richard wrote five uh, reviews out of six for the six episodes of, of Faulty Towers saying how uh, poor it was. And uh, I got fed up. I don't mind anybody giving me one or two reviews, but uh, five in six weeks was silly. So we decided to make that little joke about it. <laughs> I can't live. Come on, come on. I'm not too difficult to die. Is somebody coming? Mr. Fawlty, I know one. Isn't he work. funny, Andrew, here? Yeah. Isn't he wonderful? Open the basket! <laughs> now, 
Inside! <laughs> now, that's a good joke. That's a very good joke. I know it's all misunderstandings, but that's a particularly good one. Now, you get the city work covered. <laughs> It's a funny laugh. Really, I'm so sorry. Now, it's lovely the way this is shot, because we're thinking, well, where's the body? Where is it, you see? And this is revealed beautifully. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> yes? Could I now, this is where Raymond Mason's innocence works so beautifully, yes? It's just there. Yes, <laughs> you can't always think of a good excuse if you're under enormous pressure. As I've already said once before, stress makes you stupid. Well, yeah. I love the simplicity of... I'd like to have it. Manuel! Manuel! He's in the basket! Ah! Manuel, please! Will you get Manuel out of the basket, please? Manuel. Now, you see, we could have had a three-shot there if we'd... Um been in American television, but in uh, in American television you have five or six film cameras running all the time, so you've got the whole uh, reservoir of footage from all six cameras, and later on you edit it together and choose what you want. With the BBC, there's four cameras running, and an incredibly important guy called a vision mixer, and he is choosing at any given moment which picture from which of the four cameras to put on the tape, and that's all you've got. You only got the picture from that particular camera on that, on the tape. You don't have anything else. You can still do a few tricks when you're editing by reprinting stuff or taking shots from other parts, but it's very difficult. Eaten by the fur. Oh, there you are, dear. You do look nice. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies... Uh... Now, this is one of those situations when it was almost impossible to resolve it. And Connie couldn't... Uh, Connie and I couldn't figure out how to resolve it. And then we just got the idea that um, Basil gets out of there. And that's quite a neat move. And now here comes Ballard Barkley, going to chat to the corpse without having the slightest idea that it's the guy he's been told was shot. That's a lovely scream. And I love this cut now, the cut from, uh, from Sybil shouting Basil onto the basket, and then the music and the titles come up at exactly the right time. So there's a lot in this episode that I'm genuinely proud of, and how wonderful it is in this country to have comedy actors of the quality of Jeffrey Palmer and Richard Davies, Elizabeth Benson, Derek Royal, our corpse, Bob McBain, Pamela Buchner, Raymond Mason, Charles McEwen, and Len Martin. How lovely to have people of such wonderful comic ability. And the great thing about Britain is we've got lots of them. <laughs> I think that is the funniest and also the most perfect of all the anagrams. If you look at it, it employs all 12 letters of faulty tires. And that, I think, was Ian McLean's, who was on the production team. Now, this is an interesting episode because a very odd thing happened towards the end of the first week. We were rehearsing perfectly happily. And um, a lovely guy called Julian Holloway was playing one of the roles. And then the news came through. A BBC executive had punched a rigger in a BBC studio somewhere. And the result was there was a strike. So we were unable to record the next day because of the strike. And there was a couple of days sort of hanging around wondering what was happening. And then... The strike was sort of resolved, and we were told we would be shooting the following week. Meanwhile, Julian Holloway had told me he was not able to do the show, and thank goodness we got one of my very favourite actors, Ken Campbell, in, who's absolutely wonderful in this episode. Now, the result of all this was that we had a lot of fun, because instead of being a mad chase to try and learn everything, words and all the business in time, we had another week to rehearse. Now, Ken only had uh, a week to learn his part, but it wasn't a huge part. It was just full of rather funny short lines, which he does superbly. But the result of that is that this was much the best rehearsed, and I think in many ways the best acted of all the episodes we did. There's a fluidity and a confidence, and the timing is absolutely excellent. Even this little bit of dialogue here. Hello, dear. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, up 
Polly won't forget to put some more splits in the bar, will you? No, I'll do it later. I don't expect Polly will forget, Basil. No, just reminding her, dear. Oh, were you? Well, I thought so, yes. Really? Well, it sounded like it to me. You don't have to. You see how fast the queuing is there, and you don't get queuing that fast until you've done it a lot of times. She doesn't forget things. The other thing about this episode that's a little bit strange is it was written in a slightly different style. Um, and it's never remembered. When people pick out the most famous or most loved episodes, they always forget this one. Well, I think it's one of the best four. And I'm not going to tell you which those four are, but this, I think, is one of them. And um, Connie and I were much influenced at the time by that marvellous playwright Alan Akebourne. And we'd been to see his plays and were very interested in the way that he sometimes used uh, scenes that brought out emotions that are not the sort of emotions that you normally see portrayed in a farce. I remember the first time I saw Alan Aikman's Norman Conquest. I was roaring with laughter and then suddenly there'd be a scene and I would sort of not be comfortable about it because I would be touched about someone's emotional predicament. And it seemed odd to be touched in that way in the middle of a farce. But that's what Connie and I tried to do when we wrote this one. And I'll point out one or two occasions later on when uh, the emotions that are being displayed are, are, are much wider range than you normally get in farce. You won't hold it any longer. This week? Oh, well, when you, 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 should, you should have told me. I told you three weeks ago. Look, look. Now, I like this little negotiation. You wonder what it's about. And of course, uh, 15, 20 minutes later on, we realize why it's in the script, why we set this great need of Connie's to have a hundred pounds up. And uh, it's nicely sprung later on. Uh, could it wait just a few minutes, dear? No. <laughs> is everything all right, dear? You seem just a little bit tense. Hmm? Do you know what day it is today, Basil? Um, it's the 16th today, dear. It's the 17th, Basil. No, no, it's the 16th today, dear. <laughs> it's the 17th. And because this show is written in a slightly lower key a lot of the scenes are written in a slightly lower key and there's a good deal less audience response on it than most of the other shows got and one of the reasons for that is that some of the later scenes were shot at the back of the set on um, individual sets which the audience could not actually see from their seat so they were having to watch it on the monitor and any time that an audience has to watch part of a show on a monitor they always laugh much less now one of the things that Connie and I liked to do when we were writing this was to try and get one or sometimes even two subplots running and I think this little subplot which is this uh, big big fight or quarrel between Manuel and Terry as to who's going to make the paella which is the special treat for the friends doesn't he do this beautifully he's just noticed Sybil has left. Why? Now, don't you start. I don't want an argument. No, no, no please. please. No, be, be quiet. I told him I want you to do it. No, no, no. Mrs. Fawlty, she go. What? She leave. She leave. She go out. Now we cut to film, uh, which we shot, as I said, the uh, week before we went in the studio to record the first one. This is, this is well done. That, that was about as near as I could have got to the car. And I'm sorry, but I do like this when he gets so agitated, <laughs> he sort of jumps. I'm not aware quite what I'm doing. I just get into a particular mood. Inevitable in farces, I always say that at the most embarrassing moment, someone arrives. Now there's Ken on the left. Bit of a bump, just smoothing it out. And on the right, there's Eunice Stubbs. Um, come on in. And uh, Connie and I got to know Una because she was married to Nicky Henson, who is the wonderful guy with the fertility symbol that he bought in Colchester in the um, episode about the psychiatrist. And uh, Una and Nicky were great friends. We saw them many times. And if you go back to the Builders episode, the reason that the builder is called Stubbs is that Una's dad was a builder and construction man who advised us on the technical aspects of the script. So there's a lot of nepotism in here. Sybil, Sybil, how are you? What would you like to drink? Sibyl! Yes! Oh dear, what's the matter? Did you hear that? I said Sibyl. Yes? Oh, you got it? No, 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 I'm fine. No, 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 well, I, mean, I, call, I call her Sib, right? So Sibyl! Baswell! Oh. <laughs> Manuel! <laughs> <laughs> 
What's the matter, Basil? Yeah, what are you doing? Now, I love Una's performance in this. In fact, the acting is the best in any of the episodes because we had all this wonderful time to rehearse. So we got really loose, really confident, really on top of the lines. And the timing, the pauses, and sometimes the picking up the very, very fast cues is just top class. Even though I say so myself. No, no, Alice. I, I wouldn't actually. I mean, this little scene, she just plays it so well. I'm sure she'd like a little company. Uh, uh, I know I would. Well, you wouldn't if you don't like her. Well, you know, she, she's uh, very swollen up, you know, and she, she looks very... Uh, you know what Sybil's like about her appearance. Oh, don't be silly, Basil. She won't mind me sing. Oh, she would. I think she would. Oh, but it's her anniversary. She's up there all on her own. Ah. <laughs> ah. Old leg, bit of chip. Oh. Oh. Better have a drink. Come on through. Oh. Oh, Basil. Oh. Look, let me go. I just love Eunice's performance here. It's so sweet and so eager and concerned. Oh, let's have a drink. No, no, please. Come on, please. Why not? Well, look, she's uh, having a bit of a sleep. sleep. You know? well, she can sleep all day, Basil. She won't mind me. No, but she, 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 she's lost her voice. Lost her voice? Poor thing. God, just like that. Come on. Yes, just, just come here, Roger. After you. After you. I love Ken Campbell. Um, I saw his road show, and it remains one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen in the entire uh, 40, 50 years I've been going to the theater. And he had a line that I've never, never forgotten. He had a wonderful fellow in the show who was a midget. And uh, when the midget walked on at one point, Ken Campbell said to the audience, he said, gave the guy's name and he said, not the smallest person in the world, but f***ing close. It's one of my favorite lines of all time. And Ken did the most extraordinary things, and he was amazingly entertaining to talk to. I remember on one occasion during the rehearsal of this, um, we had lunch together, and he said, I, I believe the good Lord created the universe for the purpose of humor. And, you know, I think he actually believes it. Yes, but don't go about telling people's wives to stay in bed, do they? Oh! Now, the way he keeps picking me up, every time I'm on the verge of getting away with an explanation, he just comes in and pricks the bubble, and he does it so beautifully. Because he never does it too aggressively. He's terribly naughty, but it's done with a sort of mischief intent rather than a really mean one. Oh, yes, it couldn't be better. And you, Basil? Oh, can't complain. Well, I, I could, but it wouldn't do any good, would it? <laughs> no, shame. On your anniversary as well. Yeah, still all comes out the wash, doesn't it? We're thinking of having this room done up, as a matter of fact. Really? Mm, sort of captain's cabin, you know, put a couple of charts on the wall, a few ropes, wheel in the corner, that sort of thing. Yeah, give it a bit of class. <laughs> Wasn't my idea, Roger. Poor Sybil. Yes, Hello! Good. Now, here we have Pat Keane on the, on the left, who was one of the uh, very best performances in Clockwise, the lovely Michael Frayne film that I had the privilege of being in. And uh, Arthur over there is Robert Arnold, another top-class actor, who was playing it ever so slightly like my real-life Uncle Eric. Not well. She's in bed. That's not like Sybil. She's lost her what is it? Well, we're not... You see how good the playing is? It just flows. And this comes from doing it lots and lots of times. The great problem with Forty Towers was we didn't have enough time really to rehearse it. Somebody said to me once, did you enjoy making Forty Towers? I said, there wasn't time to enjoy it. Uh, Has the doctor been? No, but the dentist had a good look. <laughs> I love the way he does these lines. No, well, we call the doctor and we describe the symptoms to him over the phone. He, he says she ought to stay very, very quiet. Now, oh, Polly, um, what would you like to drink, Virginia? Oh, uh, medium sherry, please. Now we have the subplot. What are the symptoms? Uh, well, she's, uh, she's lost her voice and she's very puffed up. Yes, what is it? Mr. Ford, he's telling. He's being very difficult. Puffed up? What? He moved my pot. He put his pot where my pot is. Polly, what's puffed up? Beer for me. Well, put your pot somewhere else. And put it somewhere else. He move it again. What's puffed up? Lies. Well, tell him I said you ought to do it, all right? What? Lies. I tell you, he wants to make trouble. He pushes... I like this misunderstanding. Her thighs. <laughs> thighs? Well, most of her legs, actually. Now, just tell him. Go on. Basil. Hmm? Polly says her legs are puffed up. Are they? <laughs> this is classic, simple, fast bit of biz, but it's funny, I think. Sybil's legs. Sybil's legs? Her thighs. Oh, uh, yes. Now, I could have taken a little bit longer there to realise how the mistake took place, yeah. Her face is puffed up. 
up, she's lost her voice and her legs are a bit... Expanded. Sad, isn't it? Poor <laughs> oh, old sow. <laughs> but when's the doctor coming? Later. To... to... when? <laughs> Now this is nice. The the the, the punchline to this little exchange is very good. Look at she, she's in, isn't she? What's the bloody point of looking at her? I am a nurse, Basil. Oh no! <laughs> he totally forgot the cause he had. Stress makes you stupid. For all the years I've known old Virginia, she thinks I've forgotten she's a nurse. You're a marvel, you know. <laughs> Please let me go, Basil. Hmm? I want to look at Sybil. Well, you can't. Why not? Because, because... You've lost weight, haven't you? <laughs> I think you ought to tell them. Oh. Right. About the doctor coming this morning? He came this morning. First thing. Well, why didn't you say? <laughs> He thinks fast, but not as calmly as Polly does. Well, it might be. Oh, I mean, not, not completely serious, but slightly serious. Oh. Oh, now, this is a tiny little bit adventurous. It's going slightly out of fast territory. Suddenly, her, her life appears to be in danger, or is it? So that there's a level of... There could be a level of concern that doesn't feel quite appropriate in a fast. What? And we come back to that later. In the high street. <laughs> Woman. That woman who looks slightly like Sybil. You know her, don't you? You, you know? Like Sybil? What are you? Yes, very, very broad here. She's from the north. Drives a red maxi, does she? Well, her husband does, I think. I expect she borrowed it. Perhaps she stole yours, old boy. It's not out there. It's at the garage, Rog. She looks like Sybil. Yes. And she comes from the north. Well, she has a northern accent. You know, I assume, assume she, she's from the north. Mm. Oh, you've spoken to her? Mm hmm. What's her name? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but this really is one of my very favourite episodes, and I haven't seen it for 30 years. Can't we just put our heads around the corner? No, I'm afraid not. She mustn't have any excitement. No, no, no. I should have said, this is Denise Alexander, who's just terrific, and uh, Roger Hume, who will be on the screen in a second. There we are, with, uh, fourth from the left, in the middle, hands in the pockets and waistcoat. Roger is someone I'm very, very fond of, and he appeared in lots and lots and lots of the video arts training films. Stan, you're a bit upset. Well, you know. Yes, of course. You know us well enough. You should have called it off, waited till she's better. Well, I, I would have done, Rich, but there just wasn't time. Wasn't time? She only began to puff up about an hour ago. Yeah, but you said that the, the doctor came first thing this morning. <laughs> he just <laughs> won't let go, will he? He's so marvellous. After? Yes, after you. <laughs> Where have you gone? There is something very peculiar about look, all this. Look, no, I'm not standing here while an old friend of Dr. Sybil. Look, it's, it's perfectly civil. Simple's not well. She lost her throat and her voice hurt. The doctor came and said it was a bit serious. Not a lot, a bit. He went away, she started to puff up, he's coming back later this afternoon, and it's best for her to be on her own. Now, what is so peculiar about that? Her driving round... <laughs> <laughs> Now it almost gets dangerous, doesn't it? Of course it isn't, Basil. No, 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 obviously I've been standing around here making up crackpot stories about my wife being seriously upstairs. And Una knows how dangerous this could be. Kitty seeing that northern woman in the car. Funny. You notice the audience has gone quiet. They're slightly uncomfortable. You think that that was Sybil in the car and she's not upstairs, is that it? Oh! <laughs> I love Ken's reaction to that. We should have got that in a close-up, but we probably couldn't get a camera in the right place. You see, in television, you just got to have the four cameras out the front. You can't put them around the side or the back to get reaction shots, because then they'd be in a shot from another camera. So that's why so many, so much of the blocking here is consists of four or five people just standing in a line. You can't block it any other way in television. In a movie, you could. It doesn't, Basil. Well, we could just say hello. Oh, oh I love the way he does that. He somehow softens it. Doesn't make it any less wicked. I'll just uh, pop upstairs and ask her to stop dying, and then you can all come up and identify her. Right, Polly, would you give me a hand? Help us off to another drink, please. Make yourself at home. Relax. Now, this is probably the best bit of uh, acting that Connie and I ever do together, because it's prolonged and it's very physical. She realises what I'm going to do, and I can pick her up, because gorgeous as she is, she's not very heavy. 
Incidentally, um, I had dinner with her a couple of nights ago, and she sends her very best wishes to you all. You're a woman, aren't you? My face is too long! Well, shorten it. You lost your voice. All you have to do is wave. Now, this is pretty good, this throw. Watch this. This is quite good, that push. I mean, there's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. You might even be having a nervous breakdown. I don't know. I'm no expert. Now, I love the fact that she does this. She manages to calm him down and take control. What's the matter? What's the matter? I'm not doing it. You want to be in a Marx Brothers film? That's your problem. I'm not interested. <laughs> That's a funny line, that Marx Brothers film. My fault. You said to say she was ill. You were the one who invited them to come up here. They didn't even want to. You be civil. You get into the bed. I'm too big. I've got a moustache. What's this supposed to be? A great big hairy bogey? It's something you get when you're pumped up. I'll ruin you. You'll never waitress in Torquay again. That's based on that famous Hollywood line, you'll never work in this town again. I the rooms, I deal with the tradesmen, I mend the switchboard, I change the fuses. I mean, look how strong she is here. Never nasty, you know what I mean? This is genuine, righteous indignation. And she's firm as a rock. And then, of course, we refer back to the scene that happened at the very beginning of the film. Now, I like this pathetic attempt to manipulate her. <laughs> She's just not in truth. A hundred for the car. Right. <laughs> now, now it's nice because the knocking at the door, I think we think it's the friends, and of course, it's a nice surprise that it's not the friends. He's not possible. What? He's not possible for me. Now, this is one of my very favorite bits of Andrew's acting here. He's absolutely furious. To make a paella. He tell me. You tell him. I, I tell, tell him paella is a Spanish, not cockney, stinking eel pie. <laughs> <laughs> paella like my mama. I'm not interested. My mother's recipe is big in Barcelona. No, way. no, no please, you come, you come. He call me ignorant, wog, mother boy, crump. <laughs> Let go. No, no. Yes. Oh, you tell Terry, let you alone. Uh, yes, friend. Go on. Go away. <laughs> Now we get into this uh, extreme embarrassment. A lot of people are standing around not knowing what to do next. And I must say, watching it now, I, I think it's very, very funny. But you notice how little the audience laughs, and that's because they can't see it. They're, um, if you could walk through the set there, you'd see the audience looking at you. So they have to watch this on the monitors, and so their response, as I say, is very muted. Makes a change. <laughs> You see how it's blocked. There's the only way you can block it on television is to have them in a straight line. Oh, no, 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 no. Just, um, you know. She asked me to thank you and to say how very much she's looking forward to seeing you all. Sure. <laughs> she can speak a little then, can she, Basil? Um, not really, no. no I He's see got to you. watch the lies so carefully, hasn't he? Particularly with six of them there. Did you stamp it? <laughs> The trouble is, we all know that Ken is right. Ken's the only one who understands it, and I love his little asides that create all the doubt and suspicion so that they then have to start acting, really acting to pretend to believe Basil because they've ceased to do so. This is a good bit of business. That was very well done. It would have been very easy to have got that wrong. What you done? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I tell him paella is a feast dish. Go away, go away. Oh, what I do? Go away. I love the fact that he's getting so worked up, dear Ben. Well, but he still managed to make leaving at that point real. And actually, he wouldn't have left at that point. So that's great acting if you can actually do something that's kind of not quite right and still make the audience believe you. What? Shh. Hello. You see, so they all, they're all suspicious now, but they all have to act that Basil's covers to I like them. This is just so awful now they have to pick the nuts up. <laughs> and he's going to have the crisps spread anyway. This is very much sort of Alan Akeborn territory where kind of extreme embarrassment takes over. And it can, uh, it can be almost uncomfortable for the audience. Well, they've had a row. She's refused to come down. Please embarrass her into seeing us. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good bit of physical comedy, too. It's hard to do those things on television where I'm filming and do them so many times to get them right. Hmm? Perhaps she's ready now. Oh, yes. Uh, good idea. Yes, I'll just have a look. Right. Now, I'm not quite sure why uh, Connie and I 
wrote it this way. Anyone care for another crisp? I... No. But I think we just wanted to explore the. Shock eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll put them there, you know, just help God, he's so good. Oh, thank you, yes, a bit worn now. We ex wanted to explore the possibilities of sort of more dead time with nothing happening and everyone being embarrassed. Go with, the carpet, go with it! That's right, Roger. Yeah, well, one of them will have to go. My money's on the carpet. Yes. You read a lot of Oscar Wilde, do you, Roger? Yes. I don't know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the moulding out there, but one of... <laughs> that was a good fall, wasn't it? I did that very well. Morning, Poppy! <laughs> Lovely day for a round of golf. Morning, Major, yes. Anyone care to make up a four? No, no, we're, we're going to see Sybil, Major. Ah, playing a match, is she? No, no, she's ill, really quite ill. Oh, she should be in bed, you know. Yes, she is. We're, we're going in to see her. Oh, another lot in there with her, is there? Uh, his his um, questions always sort of follow. It's just he's on the wrong track. Now, I particularly like this moment, this little way that he's turned by Basil away. He's just about to go in and see Sybil. He just, we just turn him. <laughs> He's on his way. Um, it's much funnier when you have a change of direction like that if it's totally smooth. The jerkier it is, the less funny it is. Now, again, I like this scene. We've never done one before in the, in the dark and the difficulties of making their way through the room becomes apparent as they injure each other and themselves. Bloody lights! Not working. Oh, 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 who's that? Uh, 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 okay. uh, 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 it's, she does look ever, ever so slightly like Prude, isn't she? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, but I do think it's funny. I'll stop laughing. <laughs> How are you feeling, dear? <laughs> You're very swollen. <laughs> Points at the thighs. <laughs> you notice that I'm laughing a great deal more than the audience did. Yes, well, I think she's feeling a little bit tired now. There's all that waving and we're in it. What's in her mouth? That white stuff? A bit of the cog mules come out. Fifteen years, eh? <laughs> what is it? What is it? I just remembered something. D downstairs. You stay here. Have a chat with Polly. Sybil! Sybil! I'll just uh, chop him out. A chat? Does anyone know Semaphore? <laughs> now, this is a very strange scene. We never wrote another street scene like this. Because she's not just angry, she's upset. What? And so one begins to have a, a, a feelings of, of sadness or a real kind of sympathy for her, which is very odd in the middle of a farce. Fifteen years I've been with you, when I think what I might have had. Fifteen years? God. Basil doesn't want to upset her. Just doesn't want to seem cruel or unkind, just wants to get her out of here. Because maintaining this ridiculous fiction of his is... Is, is more important to him in this moment, the thought that he might, his ego might be shamed in front of all his friends. It's more important to him than relationship with his wife. Get well soon. Look after yourself. We'll have a little party when you're feeling better. Yes, I love the way Denise is doing that. Everyone in, in Western Supermare talks like that all the time. Just to see if... No, 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 no. Don't, don't be frightened. No, I'm not going to hurt you. Pat Keen is, is so good at this. <laughs> Polly finally panicked. She's so in control on this one occasion. She's so terrified of the utter humiliation that would 
follow the revelation of who she really is that she hits Pat Keith. <laughs> now, I like this now because this is a good scene. Enables us to get them uh, to the top of the stairs without any held up. And this is very well played. Audrey, we've only ever seen this once. He was always on the phone, usually because his uh, husband's left her again. Christine Shaw, very nice little performance. All of it, of course, shot, as you know, before we ever got in the studio to rehearse the show. Now, I like this uh, line of wounded there. There's a, a bleeding nose, a... Uh, a twisted ankle, a sprained wrist. Yes, yes. Sorry about all the injuries. And it's a very good camera move. Very good, Mr. Cameraman. Now, this is a very clever resolution, I think. What's he going to do? How extraordinary. We were just talking about you. That Basil Fawlty, we met once at a fete. Let me show you where it is. How is the North? Have you been up there at all recently? So he pretends that she's the woman who he invented earlier to get him out of the trouble. And then it's very nice that they go through the chaos that we can uh, stage because that little subplot has played off so nicely. So this is what... Look at you now. <laughs> this is what Basil has wrought. Sorry about the, the ankle. Why, address? Sorry. Yes, keep, keep the head right back. <laughs> Sorry, there is a display. Great fun. <laughs> piece of cake. Now it comes I like cake. piece of cake. It's a nice little dying fall. Well, as I say, I'm very uh, proud of that, and I don't think we've ever had a cast in who were better, although they were lucky enough, to, as I said, to get the two weeks rehearsal. So you have Ken Campbell, bless him, Yuna, Robert Arnold, playing my uncle Eric, Pat Keen, Roger Hume, Denise Alexander, and Christine Shaw on film in the car. <laughs> Lovely performances from Andrew and Terry, too. And here's a name I was looking to trying to remember earlier. The name of Ian McLean. Because I remember that on there he came up with two of the best anagrams. Good old Bobby Spears. Although Flowery Twats is brilliant and uses all 12 letters, I think that Farty Towels is wonderfully appropriate. And it's only missing one letter, the second W. Now I will reveal to an expectant public that you are about to see my favorite episode of Faulty Towers. <laughs> and it's the only one I think that ever started with any movement in that shot of the hotel with the notice board. You said you'd go. I didn't say I would. I said I might. I've got to do the accounts tonight. You don't have to do the accounts tonight. I do. Now, the reason I like this episode so much is I think that in terms of um, confusion uh, and chaos and frenzy, it's almost the most consistent. I think what makes it very good is that once the rat poison gets introduced, we might be talking about a serious, serious problem like the death of a human being, which causes the fear to reach unprecedented heights. Because um, I think you can always claim that in fast there is something that has happened or is happening that the protagonist has to cover up. And uh, in this particular case, uh, with the food inspector here, or the hygiene inspector, and his ability to close the hotel down, it starts at the very beginning with a lot of what the Americans call jeopardy. There is a lot to lose from the very beginning, and we go from the hotel being closed down to Basil being up on a murder charge. Carnegie, the scavenger gourmet from uh, uh, the public health department. Yes, but where, where were you born? And um, scavenger or down here in the West Country? Public health. I love the speed with which Basil thinks. His excuses aren't very good, but by God, they're quick. 
Oh, yes, the meat was. Now, the hygiene inspector is called Mr. Carnegie because for this episode we got an enormous amount of help from a delightful gentleman called Mr. Carnegie, who was the hygiene inspector, or one of them, at the Royal Borough of Kensington's Council. Just popped out for a quick prayer. Right? And uh, there was an awful lot of stuff here for Mr. Carnegie, played by John Quarmby, to learn. I would not like to have had this speech, and he gets it absolutely spot on. I recommend closure to the appropriate committee of the council. I think one of the reasons I like this episode so much is that sometimes we have a lot of guests in, but I'm very, very fond of the, not just the people, but the performances of all the key members, you know, um, Prue, Connie, Andrew, Ballard Barkley, uh, and Brian Hall, all of whom shine in this episode. They've never been better, any of them. And I think it's probably Ballard Barclay's finest performance, and they're all pretty good. Seals loose and cracked, icebox undefrosted, and refrigerator overstocked. You see what I mean about having to remember a lot. Routines, suspect. So in this, apart from uh, Mr. Carnegie, John Cornby, we have um, an upper-class couple uh, played superbly by David Neville and Sabina Franklin. And um, everyone else with any lines is a member of the permanent regular cast. And I think we're absolutely at our best in this. I think that the level of fast that we keep is really good. We hardly miss a beat. There's a couple of beats we miss, but it, it, they're, they're, you, you hardly even see them. And uh, I think as, as fast a performance goes, this is just about as good as it gets, frankly. You'll find scavenging in this kitchen will be kamikaze ones. <laughs> Thought we was in trouble there for a minute. Now you see Terry's such a wonderful character here. Dear, dear Brian Hall, who, as I mentioned earlier, isn't with us anymore. Just a marvellous, marvellous fellow. But I love his performance. He's not really thrown by anything. We know that he comes from one of those cheerful Cockney neighbourhoods where, to quote Monty Python, people are in and out of each other's houses with each other's property all the time. He's always lived on the wrong side of the law. Nothing throws him. And he's a marvellous um, balance to the relatively law-abiding people that comprise the rest of the staff. ...for soap and paper and get those pigeons out of the water tank. Yes, my little commandant. And see how many fire extinguishers are missing. I like the way that Sybil takes over here. She really starts moving for once. And of course, we never established the cat before. Um, and suddenly we're asking the audience to think that the cat's always been there. But uh, you don't mind, do you? <laughs> Isn't this funny? Doesn't he do this beautifully? I'm sorry, this is an emergency. Important. See? Now, this is one of my favourite bits of dialogue, combined with Basil's seeing the rat, which happens about halfway through. I love the fact he takes the first bit of the order and disappears before Basil can get the second bit of it out. Yes, two dead pigeons in tank, take out. <laughs> it's not difficult, man. Well, this is not a proposition from Wittgenstein. Listen, two dead pigeons... How did Basil get to hear of Wittgenstein? <laughs> what is funny? How they get up there? How they, 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 he does this so beautifully. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> oink, 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 <laughs> stop! <laughs> Just <laughs> for your... When does the audience get the pigeon confusion? Yes, pigeon! Pigeon! Like your English! <laughs> Quiet and piffle pig. Pigeon! 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 How nice of the rat to be in exactly the right place. You see, he hit his mark. This is a very, very good rat. He takes direction really well. And here comes one of my favourite of all the Fortitas lines. You have rats in Spain, don't you? Or did Franco have them all shot? <laughs> Look how well he's acting. He's just terrific. He looked at Basil then. I say to man in shop, he's a rat. He said, no, 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 it's a special kind of hamster. It's filigree Siberian. We begin to wonder what Manuel has paid for this Siberian hamster. Have you ever heard of the bubonic plague, Manuel? It was very popular here at one time. A lot of pedigree hamsters came over on ships from Siberia. What do you do? I'm sorry, Manuel, this is a rat. No, I think this is almost serious. You know, it matters so much to Manuel. He's, he's so concerned now. I think this is well played, this next scene. Where you go? Where you go? Where you take him? I'm sorry, him? man. Well, he's got to go. Go? No, no. Yes. No. He mind? He stay with me? Now look, this is a hotel. The health inspector comes tomorrow. If he sees this, I close down. No warning. 
closed down. Finito, you out of work, back to Barcelona. He no hurt. He in cage. He's safe. Please, please. What? I think this is a very good bit of business with the ladies too. Well, I told you, it's my favourite episode. I think it's all good. Sorry, shouldn't say that. I suppose it's it's pretty good, really, on the whole. Some of it, most of the time. Right, you will give it in all. Yes, that's right. I like this moment. I like this moment. We we'll look after it. <laughs> ah! Arrest! Arrest! That's very good. That's really good. And that is Suzanne Church going up the steps there. She was the um, lovely girl who came to audition for the Australian part. Take my hamster, he crazy. He think he's rat. Manuel, hmm? prepare yourself for a shock. <laughs> Why don't you check? What? Well, you mean he's had it for a whole year and you've only just found out? Yes. Well, supposing the health inspector had seen it. I know. He could have closed us down. Well, what are you going to do with it, Fowl, so you can't keep it in here? I know. And don't let it loose in the garden. It'll come back in the house. Can't we get you a mastermind, Sybil? Next contestant, Sybil Forty from Torquay. Special subject, the bleeding obvious. I wasn't going to... Another favourite line, I'm afraid. I... Well, what are you going to do with She's it? so good in this, you know. She's actually clicked into another gear, which shows that for all the chocolates and the smoky and the chat with Audrey, she's actually a very bright woman. And when she actually puts her mind to it, she's highly efficient. So you kind of get the uh, get the idea that actually um, she pulls her weight, but she spends a lot of time not working. But when she does work, she's awfully good. I wanted kind home for enormous savage rodent. <laughs> Answers to the name of Sybil. Look. <laughs> It's funny what a big laugh that does, isn't it? No, I cannot abide cruelty to living creatures. Well, I'm a creature. You can abide it to me. You're not living. That's another favourite line. <laughs> look, Manuel, we were just wondering... Mrs. Fawkey, please... Again, look at this. I love this. That's good. Please. The indignation, the determination. Yeah, the health inspector wouldn't... Mrs. Fawkey, he here one year. He do no harm. Well, that's a very good argument. Listen, if they see you're right, they could close the hotel down. Perhaps it would be simplest to have him put to S L E E P. <laughs> Who? Him or the rat? <laughs> well, if I get a discount, we had them both done. Speak. There's a lot of good lines going on here. Hey, friend, it's all right. She'll take him. Thank you, Connie, him, for writing half of them. Though Connie, if you if you meet her, will deny that she wrote half, but actually she did, and I tell you, I do know because I was there at the time. I think it's the best solution, Manuel. Oh, you'll be happy. Listen. Sad, isn't it? Well, look at it from the point of view of the rat. What? Well, would you want to spend the rest of your life with Manuel waiting on you? <laughs> now, this is a nice moment. Good choice of music. And I like the fact that for several minutes now, we really think that the rat has gone. Because when Manuel comes in in a moment, he really looks in mourning. Here we are just establishing the presence of the cat again. Cat and rat both took direction excellently. Oh, Sybil, everything done here? Have you put the lid on the tank, Basil? That's why I've been on the roof the last 40 minutes, dear, yes. And you took the pigeons out? No, I left them in. They're nearly done. Now, the walls... <laughs> Good rhythms there, a lot of pace on those lines. They, if they'd been delivered 20% slower, well, they wouldn't have got a laugh at all, I think. Oh, Just running over the bleeding obvious, dear. So, all a ship shape and Bristol fashion, eh? All ready for old Snoopy drawers? <laughs> was good. I'm glad he didn't say anything. It was nice that he just walked through. Now, um, I think the next part of this scene is quite interesting psychologically because um, Basil is a person, I think, who actually carries quite a bit of depression, but he never allows himself to feel it, which is why he's a bit manic all the time, because if you stay manic, rushing around with your muscles tensed up, you tend not to feel sadness. Now, he's very upset by the fact that uh, Manuel is sad or depressed. It, it kind of bothers him at some level, so he's trying to get him to snap out of it. But the reason he's trying to do that is because it makes him feel uncomfortable, probably reminds him of his own depression. Why, why don't you and Polly go to the ice rink today? What, what, why, why don't you cheer up for Christ's sake? You see, he, he can't stand it because it's tapping into something in himself that he doesn't want to face up to. Manuel, my wife informs me that you're depressed. Well, let me tell you something. Depression is a very bad thing. It's like you see, there was a, a generation that felt depression was a sign of weakness, which is very stupid, because depression, or much better, sadness, is how we recover from loss. When the war, by getting depressed, you know. 
I do love that line. No, I love this sudden realization. Oh, he's only acting. That's a, that's a good bit of writing. Guys, don't forget the water. Oh, Teddy, Teddy, let me have a so bit of Now you see we reinforce the idea that Basil's around. Basil the rat is around. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking in that shot. Trying to remember where Basil was, perhaps. Oh, that's nice, nice, the cat has shoes him away. Now, this is where the fun starts. We just see it here. Basil! <laughs> and, of course, you get a good laugh with it, because the name is the same. We know, I think, why he's named the rodent that. The picture! The one in your room. You said you liked it. Uh, this is Stuart Sherwin. Wait. No, I'm sorry. I, I really don't. Oh, just a fiver. You can have it on approval. Uh, sorry. Yeah, very nicely done. It's for my sister's eye operation. <laughs> you bastard. It's quite unusual to see Connie get a little bit hard-edged like that. Or rather, Polly. He escaped. But how did he get out of the cage? I leave door open so he can exercise in shed. Oh, you <laughs> dago dog. This is a nice moment, because this is... Ne we've never seen this before. We've never seen Polly roughing up Manuel. And, of course, Basil comes out, because the nature of farces. No, 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 Basil! A star key! Now go and clean it! Very nicely handled, Polly. Well done. Hello, Major. There are the papers. That's why I left it. Strike, strike, strike. Why do we bother, Faulty? Didn't know you did, Major. You see, I think uh, he does this whole episode superbly, but look at this. Boycott made the century! <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a wonderful way he just... The, the movement of the eyes was perfect. Don't move. Now, where's he going? This is nice. We think, well, what, what's he up to? He's, we've no idea what he's up to, but... Terry, give these a rinse, will you? I have. Well, they're still dirty. Uh, put them in the dishwasher. We just wanted to get him out of the way and have a little action for some time so that he could uh, not get a very clear look of the Major coming through the gun. You see, if you'd been standing at the desk, you would have seen him more. It was funnier that he wasn't quite sure what he'd seen. Do you uh, need any help, Major? Don't move! <laughs> I like the way that Basil's standing there with his hands up. He's completely resigned to the insanity. We haven't got any this week, Major. <laughs> no German staying this week, Major. May I? Going to shoot him, Volta? Yes, Major. Hmm? Not, not legal. I think the vermin German is, is, is a very good one. We tried when we were writing it to see if we could get gerbil in. Like German gerbil vermin. And it didn't work, so we had to rewrite it without the word gerbil. If you please. He's really gone this time. <laughs> About that size. That with the tail. That's a nice moment. Tail. <laughs> what did you say? What? Vermin. A dirty rat. So the, the first reaction, which is funny, is not alarm, it's fury. It's fury. Much funnier. Much funnier. Oh, and he does that so well, you see. Otherwise, if he hadn't jumped, we wouldn't have known what he was up to. The moment he jumps, we know he's guilty. Now, I think this is very good. Basil? <laughs> Basil? Yes. <laughs> oh, hello, oh, that's, that's for me, is it? Thank you. Shall I get you some more? There's plenty He's of... called Basil, is he? Don't play dumb with me. I trust you. You're and down bo bottom left, you see Andrew appears from it. <laughs> come on. Come on out. Come on. Basil's here. <laughs> I like him using the cheese. He's under there. Right, I'll get him. Oh, whoops. Cleaning behind the fridge, hmm? Well, you've got a lot on your mind. We didn't want to worry you, Mr. You see, he's an effortless liar. Effortless. Plausible is the word. He's plausible. He must have escaped, Mr. Faulty, and come back. Come back? They home. That's one of my favourite lines, and she does it wonderfully. There's a moment when she thinks what I'm going to say, then she becomes momentarily defiant, and then says it with 
just a hint of I'm not sure if I'm going to get away with this. About that. When the chef got filleted with his own carving knife, now honest. <laughs> we'll find him, Mr. Forty. Well, if you could, that would be lovely. Before they close us down, super. Well, let's have a little basil hunt, shall we? And then we'll deal with the sackings later on. I'll do this. Uh, I'll do this floor. Man, will you check? Your no, I like the fact. For, you know, the action is going. We're, we're only 15 minutes in, and already it's gone insane. Now, this is, I think, a very good bit, bit of plotting by Connie and me here. I'm sorry about that packet saying rat poison so obviously, but you have to make sure people can read things. No actual packet would look like that, of course. And that's the beginning of all the trouble. And I think this is very ingeniously worked out. <laughs> Now, when Carnegie comes back in, I don't think I come up from below quite right. I think I should have been up there earlier. Would you have coffee before we adjourn to... No, thank you. If we start upstairs with the water tanks... Ah, good idea. What? Good thinking about starting upstairs. Simple, would you, would you like to show Mr Carnegie... I was just going to, Basil. Yes, and I'll... This is very good coming up. I'll see if I can find something to be getting on with. <laughs> I think that's really good. You know, we forgot, we kind of forgot about the gun because it was put away and now it comes back in at this moment, just of course as the height. Now that's funny. Connie uses this net so funnily now. I'll get him. He'll come back to the nuts, you know. He was sniffing around here just now. I got the... Sorry, sorry, baby. That's one of the funniest moments of the whole series. A terrible way to shut him up. Now, I love the little run that Connie does now with that net. This is great farce because um, so often farce is, is based on f just funny visuals being added to the comedy that's already there. And I just want you to see that when she runs across. We'll take steps. Get up, Billy. Get up, Asano. It's all right. It's all right, man. Is, is he all right? Yes, he's all right. He's not dead. No, no, no. It was just the Major letting the gun off. Now, another thing that has to be concealed. Basil? No, no, not Mr. Fawdy. I mean Basil, my little... Ratatouille. Basil. The little ratatouille. I love this bit of dialogue. The chef calls the ratatouille basil because he puts quite a lot of basil in it. Now. <laughs> he put basil in the ratatouille. That's a great moment. Yes. Now watch this cut. It look at look at the way she runs it with that. You see how what a funny image that is. How much it adds. <laughs> Now, the audience is on a roll now, which is lovely. It's great when you can get an audience on a roll. It's all right to make them laugh now and again, but if you can just get them r laughing more or less continuously, then the laughter just gets freer and looser and bigger. Ratatouille! Man, Why are you saying he put basil in ratatouille? I had to say something. That is the health inspector. Now, will you calm down? Oh, where is he? Oh, I don't know. Well, perhaps he's dead. Oh, he's all right. Give us the veal pot. I've got to get lunch ready. How do you know he's all right? The major fire his gun. Perhaps he hit. I find him. Now, that's very well. Well done, you see, because they have to knock the veal over near the veal that's been poisoned for the rest of the plot to work. And that was done in a, in a way that was, I thought, totally authentic, totally believable. And um, we don't realize yet how the plot is now going to unfold, if I may say so, like a piece of clockwork. Say goodnight to the folks, Gracie. Say goodnight to the folks, Gracie, was um, the line that George uh, Burns always said to Gracie Allen on the uh, Burns and Allen show, which was my favorite American show in the mid-50s. And uh, Gracie Allen was one of those um, ditzy uh, and delightful Americans who said things that nobody could ever quite understand, but when she explained later why she said them, everybody could see why she had said them. Listen to me, what do you mean you picked them all up? Well, Manuel knocked them over, we picked them all up. Oh my God, what's the matter? <laughs> one of them's got raw poison on it. <laughs> now the bit of clockwork starts, and from now on there's a wonderful logic. Oh, there is Melody. Melody Lang, who is married to um, Andrew, to Andrew, that is Mrs. Manuel, there with uh, James Taylor is playing her husband here. Veal substitute. Well, it's Japanese. I love the way she says that. Soy beans and essence of cow. Seals. We move all the meat. She's very nice. Very nice. He doesn't stay in there. What is he going to do? Bottle of the Beaujolais, please. Oh, certainly. And the washout basin? We ordered it yesterday. Now, it's very interesting because he doesn't see the rat poison, but I like the way that this is done. The stillness. 
Sorry. Slip. Outstanding points. Um, someone will be dropping in to carry out a future random inspection. Now, having smashed the first bottle, I like the way now that we smash the second. I think it's quite, quite skillful. Here, if I may. Oh, certainly, Mr. Carnegie. I couldn't help noticing you had some veal over here. <laughs> Well, it's not Dutch, actually. It's uh, Norwegian. Norwegian? Yes, not the absolute apex, quite honestly. So he's got to make sure the food inspector doesn't die of poisoning in his hotel. I've been in this business 20 years. I've never heard of Norwegian veal. No, well, they've only just branched into it, you know. I don't think it's a winner, frankly. You know, more of a veal substitute. It's got a lot of air pockets in it. That's all the... The, uh, the lamb is Dutch. Dutch. Well, English. I mean, we call it Dutch because it's as good as the veal. It's better, quite honestly. Well, I prefer the veal. Yes, how about lobster? <laughs> Oh, send him a couple of lobsters there. So much having a bit of a lobster. Two for a pound. Can't say. Well, if you like the veal, perhaps you prefer the chicken. I love that line. That's very good. He's just firm. You see, he doesn't get put off. Nice movement with Connie coming in like that, just as they go out of the other door. That's what fast is all about. It's those kind of rhythms, just keeping the pace up. That's no good. That might have poison on it too. Well, where is he? What? Where's the cat slice? Uh, up there. Right, now, how's the cat? How's the cat? How's the cat? We're about to take the life of a public health inspector, and you want to know how's the cat? It's gone to London to see the Queen! <laughs> he doesn't get the point yet, but he will, but he will. Here Mr. Faulty, if the cat is... See how good the cat is? A terrific, terrific cat. Well, how long would it take to work? That stuff, two minutes. He had this ten minutes ago, at least. It's a bit chewed there. I'll give it a trim. <laughs> All the little things that happen in kitchens. Now, I love this. We've forgotten, haven't we? We have forgotten... ...where Basil put the veal. Doing I'll just relieve you of it, shall I? <laughs> Do sit down, Mr. Carnegie. He just has, Basil. On a plate of veal. Has it put you off? What? Has it put you off? <laughs> I love the speed with which Basil's on that one. Maybe it's put him off the veal. Sorry, I think there might be another one there. Excuse me. We didn't see that one put. <laughs> well, who's responsible for putting them there? Uh, Manuel, our Spanish waiter. Hey, go. Now, would you like to get the last one on please? Again, you see, I hit him without real rancor. It was just sort of. Not even an afterthought. And if I'd hit him with any anger, irritation, wouldn't have been funny. And when people try to write stuff for Basil for me to perform in commercials and things like that, they always make him um, angrier and nastier than he actually is. When he is nasty, it's because he's absolutely panicked and it takes a, a long time to get him to that state of total panic. Now, this is a good moment. <laughs> Not hot enough. <laughs> Not big enough. Sorry. What? Not big enough. Sorry. Excuse me. Really, Polly. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, if that's the one, these are okay. What? If that's the point. You see, I love the logic. It's very simple. Basil's a little bit behind on this logic, but uh, Terry and Polly have got it absolutely clear in their minds. That was the poison one. The cat had it. Answerable. Poison? Yes, so, so that one must be okay. Hmm? There's a... Sorry, just getting your proper size one. It was big enough. It was all I wanted. Well, it could have been a bit hotter. Well, not much, but... See, his performance is very nicely done. It's, it's the right degree of being disturbed. Now, here comes our upper-class pair, and they're just terrific. David Neville is rather upper middle class, but he is absolutely nothing like the character he now plays so beautifully. What are you vomiting? <laughs> it's just fur balls, but... Wonderful cat. What? Wonderful, wonderful it's cat. Fur balls. He does that all the time in the summer. But, but if he's all right, that one might... Now Basil's got the logic again. <laughs> I like the speed. Uh, too much of a good thing always leaves one wanting less, I always find. Oh. <laughs> God, it's very funny, though. See, civil servants, we were showing you any excess... Oh, oh, so you're the rat inspector. <laughs> Starling inspector. Starling inspector. <laughs> 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 Now, 
this guy is just terrific. And um, although Sabina, frankly, doesn't have too many lines, she plays it beautifully, too. It's a nice moment, isn't it? And her little movement with the legs just indicates her embarrassment and what she thinks Andrew's up to. <laughs> One that wins us. If the cat slice is all right, that might be the poison one. No, no. Yes, yes, yes he's right. And if the cat's one is all right... Which it is. We can give him that, can't we? Right! Well, then, shut up! But, Terry, that's got things on it. Oh, that's all right, Mrs Forty. What the eye don't see, the chef gets away with. Mr Forty, what is it? Table of seven. Now, that cue was ever so slightly late. It's not the strongest lie in the world, and if Andrew had come in a fraction, uh, a fraction earlier, that would have been better. Good afternoon, madam. Look, I was just trying to give an order to your waiter, and he walked away while I was doing it. Don't you love this voice? <laughs> hmm? Well, he wasn't paying attention at all. <laughs> you see, one of the things I learned was that if there is somebody behaving like a madman, he's not as funny as the people who are responding to his madness. And that's why you always need someone around who's absolutely normal to see this extraordinary behavior that, for example, these two are at the moment, but not comprehend from the beginning why they're behaving like this. Without him, this behavior just wouldn't be funny. Or if, indeed, if he was an eccentric himself. Uh, yes, Polly, would you, uh, would you take the order? Yeah, please, on this table. <laughs> One Windsor soup. One Windsor. One patty. Sir. Sir. <laughs> What do you mean, there, there? It's all there. Uh, there, 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 and there. All there, for your income. And one pate? Emmanuel, would you get the bread roll, please? No, 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 get the box. <laughs> we have a box, um, a bread box, for any uh, bread that has gone past its prime. I like the phrases that um, Basil incorporates, although they don't past its prime. You've only just started. They're wonderful, slightly grand cliches that pop off the tongue when he's not really... Uh, got his mind engaged with the tongue. Eel. <laughs> Look. <laughs> I think David is just wonderful here with his reaction. <laughs> and one wins a soup! <laughs> Those um, shots of the rat, of course, were, were shot at another time and cut into the uh, tape when we edited it. Uh, no, no, that's uh, veal substitute. Veal substitute? Yes, it's not very good. It got rather held up on the boat on the way over. From... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of... Excuses, I'm sorry, they just... We're <laughs> leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Basil says, I love that. Yes, let's get you out of here. Doesn't matter at all, he's totally lost two guests forever, but what matters is he's got away from the table where the rat is. That's good, that's a good moment when Polly says... No, I think this is awfully funny. There's very, very little movement. You see what I mean? How little movement... <laughs> Veal, yes, of course. A, a really good restaurant. No, wait, wait just a minute, because I, I do remember... I wonder if I should have done slightly more here. Begun to pull out the headscarf or whatever it is a bit further. I think I should have pulled the headscarf out further. Yeah, that's what I should have done. And, of course, the temptation is to be bitten at that point. Uh, you see how good she is? I mean, and she's absolutely spot on. This is exactly right. You're getting my gander up, you grotty little man. He's wonderful here. You look at the audience love him. And I have to tell you that I've actually pinched a couple of lines here. A couple of those lines about a um, bunch of fives I pinched from um, Peter Nichols' Privates on Parade, which I actually was in the movie of, and Simon Jones delivered them, and I thought it was such a wonderful, wonderful performance that I stole a bit of it to give to David. Now he's being bitten. That, of course, actually happened. And that's the special effects, the BBC special effects. It's really good. Terribly simple, but terribly good. Now he's got it. Now he's caught the right. Now what happens here? <laughs> Uh, some cheese and biscuits and a coffee. Now we're watching, you see, we're not hearing that at all. We're only watching what the Major's up to. Now, what, what happened to the biscuits? Uh, anything to follow? So the Major has opened the tin without seeing the rat. Uh, coffee, please, sir. Here we are, Mr Carnegie. And this is nice. It's nice that uh, Basil pushes up the, the cheese and that Polly brings over the biscuits. And now you see the best little... Um, 
piece of comic mechanism you ever will. Now, Connie will put her hand under the box, you see, and that enables her to rotate the rat's head. You see, she's, she's doing that from underneath the box. And it, I think this is a wonderful moment because the food inspector clearly thinks he's gone completely mad. Would you, would you care for a rat? <laughs> And Basil covers up very well, pops the lid on. Oh, look, there's a crumb there. We must get rid of that because this hotel is of such high quality. He, he plays this very well. Look, please. Is that a... There we are. Here are the biscuits. Green crackers, digestives, Rivita. Very good, very good, Connie. Came at exactly the right time. I'm afraid it started to rain again. Oh, that's a very nice ending, isn't it? Fade out. My favourite episode, and I think uh, I think it's partly my affection for the cast and the fact they all had good big parts in that that uh, tilts my judgement. But I still think it's about as funny as as I can do. And so when Connie and I were asked if we wanted to do a third series, we we knew that we couldn't top this, and we would need to top it for people to think it was as good. So we just didn't bother didn't make a mistake as I did by trying to make a sequel to Fish Called Wanda. Fierce Creatures is not a bad movie, but by contrast with Wanda, it was deemed to be. And there's Dougie Argent, our lovely producer, and dear Bob Spears, who did a great job on this second series.